rest of you, I'd encourage you to take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter 6. Uh, last Sunday, we looked at the spiritual power that God has given us for the spiritual warfare that we are involved in. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12 is a passage we looked at last Sunday where the Apostle Paul said to the church of Ephesus, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And we are reminded again that the source of our strength, it comes from a person. Verse 10 says, be strong in the Lord. It cannot come from ourselves. The strength that we need in the spiritual warfare that we find ourselves, the spiritual battle that we find ourselves on a daily basis can only come from the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. So be strong in the Lord. And then our strength comes from a provision in the power of his mind. You know, it is, we are very limited in what we can do and things that we may be able to pick up and lift. But God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, is all-powerful. And so the source of our strength is the Lord, and the provision of that strength is the power of his might. We then looked at the source of our stability, put on the whole armor of God. We are embattled by the wiles of the devil. He is tricking, he is scheming, he is trying to do everything that he can to thwart the purposes of God on earth, to thwart the purposes of God for salvation of mankind, and then to thwart the purpose of God for the, the believer to live a life of joy and happiness and peace and contentment. The devil doesn't want that at all. So he's trying to destroy. He's trying to discourage the people of God and defeat them. That is who we are embattling. But we are equipped because... We have the whole armor of God. It's kind of a one-time thing. We put it on, and then we keep it on. We don't take it off. We can't relax in our spiritual life. We can't let down our guard because our adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And then we talked about how we are enabled that ye be able to stand. You know, there, there are some things that are worth standing for, that are worth fighting for, against our enemy. And then we conclude with the source of our struggles. The enemy is not flesh and blood. The enemy is not a physical person. The, ever, the enemy is not even a, a government office or political figure. The enemy is the devil. The enemy is the world, the flesh, and the devil. Again, the only way that we're going to be victorious in the spiritual warfare against our enemy is in the power of God and to use his army, uh, his armor. Look at verse 13 of Ephesians 6. We'll begin this morning where it says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. You see the repetition? Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Verse 13, wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand so we have, again, a repetition of the armor and of standing. You know, you think about in a conflict, in a battle, in, and you're fighting an enemy, if you have all of the armor, all the weapons that you need, and it's just a matter of you putting them on and using them, and you're guaranteed victory to be successful. How foolish it would be to uh, disregard the armor to not put on the armor because of the time that it takes. Um, I, I know that we have uh, folks in our congregation uh, that serve in law enforcement. Every time I see a law enforcement officer, I think about all of the gear that they wear. And, and I don't even know how much it weighs, but it's got to be an additional amount of protection of everything that they're putting on. But they wouldn't go to their... Um, their, their precinct. They wouldn't go out on the job. They wouldn't go to um, pull someone over or to serve a warrant without the protection and the armor and the uh, weapons that they need for their peace and for their protection. So we are to take unto us the whole armor 
of God. It, it says also in verse 13 that we are to withstand the attacks of the enemy. That word withstand means to resist. It also says um, in verse 13 that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Well, what is the evil day? The evil day is today. The evil day is every day that you and I take a breath because we have a real enemy in the world, the flesh and the devil. And, and he doesn't take a vacation. He doesn't take a day off. He doesn't have a, okay, let's have a ceasefire for, for a little bit so we can kind of re- recuperate and recover ourselves. No, today is the evil day. I read this article recently posted by Pastor Paul Chapel entitled, When the World Calls Wrong Right and Right Wrong. We, and this is an illustration of the evil day that we're living in. We live in a day of amazing confusing confusion. But what makes the confusion especially disorienting is those that who are creating it don't act bewildered or perplexed. Instead, when we point out what seems to be obvious, they tell us with a straight face that we are the ones that are confused that these issues are more complex than we could understand, that the problem is with us. Pastor Chapel goes on to say this was especially clear during the most recent election cycle in California when the black candidate was called the face of white supremacy. Governor Newsom stated the election was a matter of life or death, but he is unequivocally for abortion, which takes the life of preborn children. He goes on to say, but this is bigger than just the California election cycle. It's across our nation. Here are some of the current events, the evil days that we live in, where right is called wrong and wrong is called right. There was a school board that silenced a dad trying to alert others of a transgender student who raped his daughter in the woman's bathroom. Somehow, the dad, not the sexual assaulter, is the villain and is labeled a terrorist? It's insisting that women have the right to choose to take the life of their preborn child, my body, my choice, but parents do not have the right to choose if they will have a child vaccinated. It's a culture that defunds the police while defending violent protest. It's an ideology of inclusivism that excludes anyone who states obvious realities such as binary genders. It's a morality that embraces what God clearly declares is wrong. Same-sex marriage, transgenderism, state redistribution of wealth, taking the life of the unborn, rioting and lawliness while rejecting the Christian values that allow for law, order, and the traditional family, which are bedrocks of civilized society. He goes on to quote Isaiah 5.20, which says, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil, that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Okay, that's just a little bit of what's going on in the world today. The evil day that you and I live in, that's why it's time for us as Christians to wake up, to cast off the works of darkness, to put on the armor of light. It's worth it for us as men, for husbands, for dads, to put on the armor, protect our homes. It's worth it for us as a congregation for us as believers, to stand strong in this battle because we are living in evil days. They're days of battle, conflict, warfare, and even casualty. And I'm so thankful that although it's difficult and sometimes frustrating, it is possible to stand because God commands us With God's commands are always his enablement. It's not in and of ourselves, but it's by him. Again, verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand the evil day, and having done all, to stand. 
In verses 10 through 12, we've seen the spiritual power that is available for us. And now as we follow in verses 13 through 18, we're going to see the provisions that he has given us. And it's all so that we can stand. Let me ask you a question. Today, have you done all that you could? Have you surrendered all that you are to the Lord Jesus Christ and picked up the armor of God so that you can stand? Teenager, in that public school classroom, on that public school school bus, on that sports team, in that workplace, wherever you may find yourselves on, in that online environment, have you done all you can do to stand? We are living in an evil day, and it is possible for us to stand faithfully. Martin Luther, on April 2nd, 1521, stood before the Diet of Worms. He was accused of heresy for his views of salvation. After being condemned for preaching that men are saved by faith alone in Christ Jesus, he declared, My conscience is captive to the word of God. Here I stand. I cannot do otherwise. Our homes, our church, our community, our workplace, this world would be different if believers stood in the power of the Lord's might. If they put on the armor of God. And praise the Lord for examples of people who have stood. But there are many examples of believers who refuse to stand. Of believers who fell back to the wiles of the devil. Who succumbed to the evil day and they're no longer faithful. That was Paul's fear. 1 Corinthians 9, 27, But I keep under my body, and I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. The Apostle John said in 2 John in verse 8, Look to yourselves, that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. We don't have to fall away. We don't have to be disqualified or set on a shelf we can be faithful to the end. We can say, as Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, 7, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. But that is absolutely impossible unless we wake up to the spiritual battle that we're in. Unless we realize that we have to have God's power and his strength. We have to put on his armor. We can't just select this piece and that piece. We have to put on the whole armor armor of God so that way we can withstand that way we can do all that we have done to stand against our enemy as I mentioned last week we don't fight for victory we fight from a position of victory we are victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ it's helpful for us to remember that the devil is a defeated foe and that his end is recorded in the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 20, it talks about, and death and hell and the devil were cast into the lake of fire, which is the second death. But today, we need to be encouraged to stand. We need to be encouraged to put on the whole armor of God. But you know what? We live in an instant society. Instant mashed potatoes aren't fast enough. Instant oatmeal. I mean, I gotta watch the oatmeal to make sure it doesn't bubble over. I can have it in in I can have my two packets of oatmeal. Apple and brown sugar is my preference. Uh, then it's uh, apple spice, and then after that it's you know the other ones that are in there. But I, I'm watching it, and it's still not fast enough. And, and a lot of times, as Christians, we think, okay, God, I got. I got two minutes for you right here. I'll make sure my armor's on. I'm going to get my scripture verse. I'm going to throw up my, my prayer to you, and then I'm good for the rest of it. That's all we have time for. But to stand, to put on the whole armor of God, it is going to take 
time. It's going to take discipline. It's going to take consistency on your part and my part. Several years ago, I think it was when we were on the fire station, so it was probably about 10 years ago, I preached from this passage and I came across this story written by John Duckworth. It's entitled, The Most Fashionable Buy Isn't Always the Right Wisest Choice. I'd like to read this for you because it really does shed light upon our adversary, the devil the wiles of the devil. May I help you? Came a voice behind the counter. The young man looked around the little clothing shop. I'm looking for an outfit. I was heading for an outfit shop that claims to be the official outfitter, but I've also heard that the price is pretty high. They want practically everything you've got. The nerve of that other store. Well, what kind of outfit would you like? A suit of armor. You see, I just joined up to fight the battle and they gave me this list of armor I'm supposed to wear. Oh, that armor. We have an old suit like that in the back, I believe, but take my word for it, you won't like it. Why not? It's simply out of fashion. No one would be caught dead in a suit like that these days. Yeah, but I'm supposed to get one. You know, put on the whole armor, they told me. Oh, very well. What's first on the list? The girdle of truth. A girdle? I have to gird my loins with truth. Do you have one or not? The salesperson disappeared in the back room, reappearing with a wide leather band. Ouch. Doesn't it come in a larger size? Sorry. You know how the truth is. One size supposedly fits all, but it's so constricting. Yeah, I guess so, but I have something else that may be more to your liking. The salesman reached under the counter and pulled out a piece of string. What's that? The sash of sincerity. I think you'll be quite comfortable with it. Who needs truth if you're just sincere? Well, I guess that makes sense. I'll take the sash. What's next on the list? The breastplate of righteousness. Ugh. I really hate that. It's probably rusty by now and it weighs a ton. Yeah, but my list. I know, I know. He went in the back room returning with a large iron breastplate. It doesn't look uncomfortable. But how can I go into battle with it? Try this, reaching into a nearby rack and pulling out a sports shirt. Hey, I like this, but how can this replace the breastplate of righteousness Look at the insignia over the pocket. Is it a Ralph Lauren polo insignia? No, it's a smiley face. The international symbol of righteousness. No, niceness. You're wearing the sport shirt of niceness. A perfect substitute for righteousness. With a bright red color, the enemy will never notice you sneaking through the forest. The shoes of the gospel, continued the young man. Yes, the most unattractive footwear known to man. The salesman pointed to a pair of black boots in, in the case. Wouldn't you rather wear those nice little running shoes you have on? Well, yeah, but they told me, of course they did. I've got something even better. Gospel socks. 100% cotton with tiny little crosses printed on them. But who's to see them? They'll be hidden in those comfy shoes of yours. The young man agreed that the price was a mere pittance to pay over these boots. Now I need the shield of faith. My boy, you may need faith, but you don't need a shield. No one's used a shield for centuries. This is the atomic age. The young man looked concerned. You want a shield? I'll give you a shield. But not one of those big bronze things. I have a button instead. A button? They're shaped like shields, only much smaller. You can pin it right on the side of your shirt. They're the buttons of belief. Yeah, but I need faith. Faith, belief, they're both the same. Just look at the wonderful slogans on the buttons. The young man picked a bright yellow button. Yeah, I kind of like this one. It's you, agreed the salesman. Next is the helmet of salvation. Believe me, that's like wearing a galvanized bucket on your head. What's so important about salvation? 
Well, you know, spending an attorney with, no, no, the man cut him off. Security is what everyone wants. That's, ex that's exactly what you'll get with the headband of security. Keeps you dry in the heat of battle. That's the kind of protection you really need. I'll take it. Very good. That leaves, don't tell me, the sword of the spirit. Yeah, right. Much too expensive. I have something much better. The brass knuckles of situation ethics. Don't pierce like the old swords do. Yeah, I could really use something sharper, though. Sharper? Hmm, of course. What you need is a tie tack of tolerance. Our desires have managed to reduce the sword of the spirit to the size of an ornamental purposes. There is still a back, uh, a bit of stick pin on this back. But I can never do battle with this. Why? It would barely draw blood. Blood? Young man, we're talking fashion here. We're not a soldier in war. Admiring himself in the mirror, the young man said, I do look pretty good, don't I? You know, I guess you're right. I'll take the whole outfit. Who do I make the check out to? <laughs> Beelzebub, said the salesman. Well, thanks, said the young man, and he turned to go. Glad I came here instead of that other store. So am I. So am I, said the salesman, as he quietly took a tiny bow and a fiery dart from underneath the counter. So am I. Let me ask you, have you exchanged the armor of God for something a little more fashionable? Or probably more applicable is a little more comfortable. We, we don't like restriction. And by the way, I'm thankful for freedom, the freedom of choice, the freedom that so many have fought to protect for our country. And we thank God for that. But I, I have a driver's license. Does that mean that I can drive on the streets any way that I want to? No. There are laws to abide by. If you ask me if I always abide by the speed limit, I'll ask you first, and then I'll answer. But just because I have a license does not mean I can do anything that I want. I have a hunting license. This Thursday, I'm going to leave and go out Friday morning, Friday night, Saturday morning. And hopefully, I'll see a mule deer buck. And hopefully, I'll get my gun out, look through that scope, see that buck, and fire that round. And hopefully, before Brother Scott Warner does, and I'll bring down that buck. I, I have a rifle. I have a license. But that doesn't mean that I can shoot anything I want. There are guidelines. And, you know, we live in a world today, and we live in a brand of Christianity today that cheapens the grace of God into a license to live whatever way you want, to do whatever you want. But that's not what the Bible teaches. Paul said in the book of Galatians that we are to stand fast in the liberty wherewith God or Christ hath made us free, but use not your liberty as an occasion to the flesh, as a cloak of maliciousness. We've been saved by God's grace, and that grace that God has saved us in, he wants us to live a life for him. And this is what he's done for us. He says, I want you to know you're in a battle. I want you to know you've got a real enemy. The real enemy is the world, the flesh, and the devil. And the devil is out to get you. He's a roaring lion. He's an angel of light. He likes to portray what is wrong as right. He's an angel of light. And he'll try and trick you. But I want you to know that you can stand. You are already victorious because of what Christ has done and because he's left you the word of God and the spirit of God. But this is what you've got to do. You've got to stand. And it's not in your own strength. It's in the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I've given you armor for this battle. 
I provided it for you. But a lot of us are just living like, like I used to play with my cousins at grandma's house down in the basement in Iowa. We would play war. And usually Karen, the youngest cousin, would usually get hit with a plastic bowling pin and she'd go up and cry to grandma. Then grandma would come down, we'd all be in trouble. But it was play war. And that's how we view the spiritual battle that we're in. That's how we live our lives throughout the week, disregarding God, not acknowledging him, not relying upon him, not yielding to him, not being in his word, not being filled with his spirit, not meditating upon truth of God's word, not taking the armor that he's given us. We are in a spiritual battle. What am I doing to stand? Well, you know, I was younger, I stood. But now that I'm older, I praise the Lord for faithfulness. In our adult Sunday school class, we talked about Daniel. Daniel chapter 6, he is promoted into the next in command after Darius. He is preferred above everyone else. And he's probably in his 80s to 90s. There is an excellent spirit found in him. The presence of the princes spent some time looking to find a fault with him, and they could find none except for concerning his faith. Regardless of your age, regardless of your abilities, have you done all to stand in the evil day? Have you put on, have you kept on the armor of God? This morning in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 14, we are introduced to this first piece of armor that the Lord has given us. Verse 14 says, stand therefore having your loins Gird about with truth. If we were to go back into Bible times, if we were to look at a Roman soldier, the attire for the Roman soldier, besides all of his gear, would have been like a loose-fitting tunic. It was nothing more than just a large piece of material that had a hole for the head and a hole for the arms, but it was flowing, and it was wide. And for that Roman soldier, if he was engaged in battle or if he was engaged in work, he would have a belt, a girdle that he would wrap his cloak in and bring it close and tight to himself so that it wouldn't snag on something. You know what it's like to get get, um, your clothing snagged on something, to be walking and to snag on something? Well, can you imagine being in battle and having this this, this flowing robe, it'd, be, it, it'd give a, uh, an advantage to the enemy, right? If you're a football fan, if you watch um, uh, a football, you'll notice that they're, they're, they're not with um, that they're not out there with you know tunics on with all these grabbing points. I mean their uniforms are very streamlined and very conformed to the body. They don't want any extra grabbing holds for that. And, and so the belt was a very important piece of, of uh, equipment for the Roman soldier. Um, also in Bible times, just the regular people that went about and did business and they did work, they would use a belt to put around their loins to gather up their tunic. When it came to the nation of Israel leaving Egypt, the Lord Jesus Christ said in Exodus twelve eleven, eat it speaking of the Passover lamb, with your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your staff in your hand, and ye shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. In other words, you need to be ready because we are going to be moving. Uh, You know what it's like to, to be wanting to go somewhere and you're waiting on someone to finish getting ready, finish getting their shoes on, I recently got a new pair of of shoots of uh, uh, boots that I'm still working in, but I tell you what, it takes me about five minutes to get those boots on. It takes a while. Are you ready for the spiritual battle today? Have you taken the 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 belt of truth, the girdle of truth, and have you fashioned it about you? The Lord Jesus Christ said in Luke twelve thirty five. 
let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. I'm going to be coming back. Are you ready? Now, we don't wear robes today, so we're not talking about uh, this leather girdle or belt that we would actually fasten our robe together. But when it comes to mental and spiritually, are we girding up our mind, our thinking with the belt of truth? Listen to 1 Peter 1.13. Peter said, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. You know, this belt that we wear in our spiritual battles, it's not a a physical belt that we're putting on, but it is the belt of truth. What is it, what does it mean to have my mind girt with the belt of truth? It's talking about the Word of God. So when Paul speaks about being girt with truth, he's first of all re- referring to truth found in the Word of God. What you know, what you believe. John seventeen seventeen, Christ said, Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. You know, if you and I as believers do not have a working knowledge of the Word of God, the truth of the Word of God, we're in for defeat and discouragement and destruction from our enemy. He knows the Word of God. He knows how to twist it. He knows how to pervert it. Paul already warned in the, to the book of uh, to the believers in Ephesus in Ephesians 4:14 that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. Have you done all to stand? To withstand? Are you resisting? By putting on the whole armor of God. By taking the belt of truth. There's one way to combat error, and that is through the truth. It's my understanding that they teach people to identify a counterfeit bill, not by teaching them all the different counterfeit bills, but by teaching them the truth of the original. Because if they know what the original looks like, they'll be able to detect a counterfeit. Can you detect the counterfeits of this world? Can you detect the attacks of the world, the flesh, and the devil? It is only through the truth of God's word. We can only combat error with truth, to know the truth, to expose the lie by the truth. Aren't you thankful that the Bible is accurate? That we don't have to be still looking for the word of God. God inspired his word, and we believe that he preserved that inspired word for us today. So when I look at 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, I can have full confidence that those were the words that Paul gave, that God gave Paul to give to Timothy, where he says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect or complete, mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It'll help us know what's right, what's wrong, how to get what's wrong in my life right, and how to keep it right. The truth of God's word. Are you a casualty of the truth? Because you set it aside. Because you have refused to heed it. First Timothy 4 1 says, Now in this now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. The Bible tells us that there's one way to heaven. The world will say there's many ways, but the Bible says there's one way. <clears throat> John 14, 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The Bible tells us of our condition, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. As is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. For the wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible says. It gives us the truth. It tells you that if you die in your sins, you'll die and you'll go to hell. 
forever. Well, that's kind of unkind. Wouldn't you rather be told something that's unkind but true before it's too late? But I thought you could just be good. I mean, isn't being good and kind to people an important thing? Yes, it is. But that won't get you to heaven. For by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For, for by grace are you saved through faith that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are not saved by our works, but by the grace of God. Acts 6, 13, 16, 31, Paul said to the Philippian jailer, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. You mean there's nothing that I can do to be saved? Or I've got a family member who's already died, and I've been taught that I could do things to get them out of hell or to get them out of purgatory. That's not in the Bible. The truth from the scriptures says, and as it is appointed a man once to die, but after this, the judgment. And if you die in your sins, without your sins forgiven, you will go to hell, the lake of fire for all of eternity. And I don't say that unkindly. I say that in love because you need to hear the truth. The truth is, is that if you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, if you repent, if you turn from believing that your works can save you, that your baptism can save you, that your communion can save you, that your church can save you, if you turn from that belief system and you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, that he's the son of God, that he died on the cross for your sins, was buried and rose again, and you ask him to be your savior, then you can be saved. That is the truth. There are a lot of good people who will die and go to hell. Because the God of this world, the devil, has blinded them into believing that they're good enough. I mean, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I'm not a terrible person. God wouldn't send me to hell. You're wrong. By the way, it's not God that sends you to hell. It's your sins that send you to hell. James says that if I am guilty of one point of the law, that I'm guilty of all. So what, and this is kind of going off on salvation, but if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, that's the first thing that you need to do is you come to the truth of God's word. There's only one way to heaven, and it's through the Lord Jesus Christ. Believer, how are you standing today? Have you done all you can to surround yourself with the truth of God's word? And by the way, the truth of God's word just as doesn't deal with salvation, it deals with every area of your life. Every area. A great start to read in your devotions is the book of Proverbs. Read 10 verses, the first 10 verses, for one month. Today's the 24th, so read chapter 24, verses 1 through 10. Then when you get to the 24th of the next month, read verses 11 through 20. And then the next month, some of them you won't get to 30, but most of them do have 30 verses. Expose yourself. Meditate upon the truth of God's word. Philippians 4, 8, finally, brethren, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are lovely? What sort of things are of good report? If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. What are you thinking about? What have you girded your mind with? Now, next Sunday, Lord willing, we, we've looked at the, the content of truth. We need to know the truth. But next Sunday, we're going to look at the practical application because I can know a whole bunch of truths. But unless I'm applying it in my life, it doesn't do any good. So, Ephesians 6, 13, Paul says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, we're in evil days. And we're just looking right now at the belt of truth, the girdle of truth, 
but are you concerned with the truth? I'm glad you're here this morning. That means you're interested in the truth of God's word. What's going to happen this afternoon, this evening, tomorrow? Am I going to apply that truth? Or, hey, I've done my church thing. It's time to disengage and live my life the way that I want to. Friend, you are headed for trouble. We have a real enemy. And he's got a big bullseye all over you. And if we're going to stand, and having done all to stand, we need to stand in the Lord's might and to put on the whole armor of God. If you would, please take your Bibles and turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6. And we continue in our series in the book of Ephesians. And uh, this is our, our third message when it comes to the spiritual warfare. Uh, we're so thankful for the spiritual power that the Lord has provided for us. And verse 10, Ephesians 6, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And we were reminded two Sundays ago about the source of our strength that comes from the person of Lord Jesus Christ, and it comes from the provision of his might. Uh, we then saw the source of our stability in verse 11, where he says, But put ye on the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And yes, we are embattled. We have a real enemy. But we are equipped with the armor of God, and we are enabled so that way we can stand and be victorious against that enemy. In the verse 12, we saw the source of our struggles. Uh, what it is not, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And so, yes, we do have a wicked enemy in the devil, but also this world that's against God and also our sinful flesh as well. Last Sunday, we started to look, about, uh, look at the spiritual provisions that God has given us to go along with this spiritual power. Verse 13, he says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, and the purpose is that ye may be able to withstand an evil day, and having done all to stand, we certainly do live in evil days. And if we're going to stand, if we're going to be victorious, then we must take on the whole armor of God. And we began looking in verse number 14, where we see, first of all, he says, Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. We look at the uh, cultural um, uh, thoughts about that as far as uh, the soldier. Um, he would have that long flowing robe along with the rest of the armor, but that, that, um, that belt of tr truth here, that girdle, it was used to help bind up uh, his robe, so that way the enemy would not have a, a, a handle in the bat battle, something to grab hold of. And so it was very important. Also, when uh, they were doing any type of business or they doing any type of activity, many times they'd grab their robe up and they'd put it together with a belt, uh, with a girdle. And, and so it is true also, the Lord Jesus Christ, or excuse me, God said to the Hebrews in the Old Testament, he says, when you eat the feast of the Passover, have your um, loins gird about, be ready. And Christ even said that we're to gird our minds as well with the truth of God's word. And so we looked at the importance last week of girding our minds with the truth. First of all, the content of truth, and that is found in the word of God. Our, one, of our greatest, um, one of our greatest tools that the enemy uses against us is error. And, and so even from the first temptation, the Garden of Eden with Eve, the devil twisted the truth of the word of God and what he had told Adam. And so we need to know the truth of what the word of God says. Just like we heard from David Barton this morning, there has been a successful attempt over the last 30 years to remove the truth of American history to where people don't know about our history and the foundation of our country and replace it with lies and just sharing uh, at times the bad points of our American history. And so if we're going to be victorious, if we're going to do all we can to stand the evil day, we must know the truth of God's word. Uh, we looked at that truth specifically in the area of salvation. 
how sad it is to see that there are many different ways of salvation in the world today, but there's only one true way. And we can look at that in the scriptures and we can see that although many cults, uh, they teach different ways and their different ways all have one similarity in common and that is a works-based um, merit to get salvation. And so we must know the truth of what God's word says about salvation. We must know the truth of what God's word says about us as believers, our, our standing in Christ, our, our responsibility as a believer, what God would have for us as a believer when it comes to our relationship to the word of God, when it comes to our relationship with other believers, when it comes to our relationship with being a witness and a testimony, when it comes to our relationship with our, our, our family uh, in the home, when it comes to our relationship with our fellow citizens of this great country. So we must know the truth of God's word. If we don't know the truth of God's word, then how are we going to successfully be victorious? How are we going to successfully stand? How are we going to answer the questions that our children have when they come home from school? And they've been indoctrinated about um, it doesn't matter what gender you were born with. It just matters what gender you identify with. And the, the terrible indoctrination that's going on in the world today. And we must know the truth so that we, we can combat the truth. So the content of truth is found in the word of God. And I'm so thankful that all scripture, not just pieces, not just uh, portions of scripture, but all scripture is given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction, in righteousness, that we can be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. But it's just not the co content of truth that we need to gird our, our, the loins of our minds about, but it's also the attitude or the application of truth. Uh, there are so many things in this world that can distract us. We may know the truth of God's word, such as even assembling together in God's house. But there's so many things that can distract distract us from the truth of God's word. There are so many things that can distract us from living out the truth in the workplace or living out the truth in the, in the home, living out the truth with our classmates on the sports team. And so not only do we need to know the truth, but we need to apply the truth. Uh, you know, this, this past weekend, I got to go out, uh, two days on, um, uh, a hunt. And, uh, I told, uh, I I think I told Robin this, or maybe it was Jeffrey this morning, but last night when I closed my eyes, I saw all I could see was deer when I closed my eyes. Now, I'd love to say that I could see that yesterday morning when I was out. I, we saw 20 does, but there were no antlers on any of them. I'm like, oh, man. And you know what? Even when I closed my eyes last night, there were no antlers on any of the deer. I mean, at least I could have saw some antlers in my dream there. But, you know, when, when I was getting ready for the hunt and even going out yesterday morning, woke up at 3 o'clock in the morning, and, you know, I was, I was getting ready, um, and, and I'm getting all my gear and, I mean, everything. There's a lot that you need to have to go hunting. And, and you know, one of the most important things is ammunition, right? And, and how, how silly it would be is if, if you know you did you had everything but you forgot your ammunition well how foolish it is if if we have all this truth in our head and even in our heart but we don't apply it i mean it doesn't translate from when we walk out the door it doesn't translate in our marriage it doesn't translate with our children it doesn't translate in, in the community and so there needs to be an application of this truth. And we need to be diligent. 2 Timothy 2, 4, Paul says to Timothy, No man that warreth entangled himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath called him to be a soldier. So just as a soldier would gird himself up with a belt, so that way he wouldn't get entangled in the battle, he wouldn't get snared or snagged on, on objects or on trees or things like that, so it is that we must gird ourselves up with the truth, but apply the truth. So we're not entangled with the things of this world and the affairs 
of this life. You think about the athlete in Bible days. They had commitment. They had discipline. And it was all to obtain a corruptible wreath that would fade away. And, and they would deny themselves. They would discipline themselves. Uh, they would go through great regimented routines and training. And it was all to obtain a corruptible crown. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Yes, I want to know the content of truth, but I need to be able to apply the truth in my daily lives. To, gir to be girt about with truth is to be renewed in the mind and is to be absolute committed to applying God's truth, God's will in my life. Matthew 16, 24. You know, there were a lot of people that wanted to come after Christ and follow him. I mean, he was one miracle show after another. Blind people being healed, lepers being healed, lame people being healed. I mean, people being brought back to dead. Talk about an amazing person to, to follow after. But Christ says, you know, if you're going to follow me, the foxes, they have their holes, the birds have their nests, but I don't have anywhere to lay my head. Oh, well, I'll follow you, Christ, but first of all, let me go bury my father. His father wasn't dead. He wanted to wait till after his father had passed away. You see, so many people, there's something else they want to do first before they're committed to Christ, before they're following Christ. But for you and I as believers, if we're going to do all we can to stand in the evil day, we must have our loins girt about with truth and not only knowing the content of truth, but applying that and being committed to living the truth out in our lives. You know, the, the Roman soldier, he girt his loins about so that way he would not be encumbered. He would not, um, there wouldn't be a grab hold for the enemy. And we need to, there's so many things in this life that are vying for our attention, and we need to gird our, our, our minds up and our decisions with the truth of God's word, embracing the truth and living out the truth in our daily lives. But here's another thought. The Roman soldier also girt his loins about the hip region, kind of like where we wear our belt, because it was believed that if he was damaged in the hip region, he would not be able to reproduce. He wouldn't be able to have any children. Why is it that we have so many Christian families with children walking away from the church, walking away from the truth? It's because many times, we haven't had our loins girt about with truth. It may even have been that we believed the truth and we taught the truth, but we didn't practically live out the truth. You know, there is a generation that's coming up in our children's Sunday school class and our teen Sunday school class that not only need to know the truth, but they need to see it lived out before them. So we can pass the truth down to future generations. So are my loins girt about with truth? Is my mind, what I'm thinking about, focused upon the truth of God's word and the application of it? Am I committed to the truth that I know and living that out before others? So the first provision that God has given us is his truth to have our loins girt about with truth, to have our mind girt about with the truth of God's word. But secondly, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 14, it says, Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and then it says, and having on the breastplate of righteousness. What was the breastplate? Well, the breastplate was a sleeveless piece of armor that covered the full torso of the soldier. Uh, no Roman soldier would go into battle without the breastplate in place. There were several breastplates in that day. A very common one was to have uh, pieces of leather, thick leather, strapped about, and then they would 
um, fashion. They would uh, tie to that leather uh, pieces of metal, pieces of bone, and even pieces of, of, of hooves of, of animals as well. Another common one was to have thick uh, fabric as well with, with pieces just like the leather tied to it. But then if you were real serious or you had the means, um, you could have metal um, hammered and fashioned to fit around your torso. Uh, the torso, what does it protect? Protects your heart, protects your lungs, protects your kidneys, protects your inwards, your stomach region. How important would that be in a battlefield? I mean, if the enemy shot an arrow or a sword came across uh, the chest area and there was nothing to protect the chest, uh, it could be fatal wound, right? Uh, not only, and you say, well, it didn't hit a major organ, but if, if there was a gash inside the torso area, an infection could set in, and then certainly death would follow. So it was a very important region to protect in the battle. What is, how does that apply to you and I? Let me ask you this. Have you ever said this? Well, I love them with all of my heart. I believe this with all of my heart. Uh, the Bible actually has some things to say about the heart. Proverbs 4.23, keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. The heart there is speaking of the seat of your thinking, your intellect, your emotions, your will, what I'm thinking about, how I feel, and the decisions that I make, I am to keep my heart with all diligence. Uh, the bowels are referred to as the inward organs as well. It's In the Bible, it's represented as a seat of emotions or feelings. Philippians 1.8, For God is my record, how greatly I longed after you, all in the bowels of Jesus Christ, my emotions, my feelings. Philippians 2.1, If there be therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, Colossians 3.12, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercies, kindness, humbles of mind, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. So this terminology referring to the heart in the Old Testament and the bowels of mercies in the New Testament. Just as a Roman soldier would see, I've got to protect my vital organs do you as a Christian know how important it is that you guard what you think about and how you feel? When it comes to your thoughts, when it comes to your emotions, your feelings, these are perhaps two of the areas where Satan attacks the most in a believer. What does he want to do? He wants to fill our minds with false doctrine and false truth. How sad it is to see someone come to know Christ as their personal Savior and they begin to grow in their Christian walk only to be devoured by the false cults and indoctrinated in false doctrine. You see, if the devil can get us to think false doctrine, he will keep us from going forward for the Lord Jesus Christ. The Satan wants to use the wicked world around us to tempt us to think wrong thoughts, which will produce wrong emotions. These wrong thinkings, this wrong thinking and the wrong feelings will cause us to love the wrong things, will cause us to love the wrong priorities. And I know tonight is, um, it, it, and I'm not going to preach against Halloween but I will tell you this, just in the last few weeks, going door to door and inviting folks to church, there are some extremely wicked and ungodly decorations. To walk up to a house and see a playhouse, a dollhouse, and on the second level, a little girl is hanging from a noose. To walk to a yard and see a giant lollipop with body parts sticking out of it. Do you think 
the devil has got our world, our nation thinking the wrong thoughts? One door we knocked on, my wife and I, a young girl, I don't know, college student, maybe young mother, she came to the door and I, I said, um, hi, we're from, my name's Curtis, my wife, Robin, we're from Open Door Baptist Church. We're just in the area inviting folks to church. And I wonder, do you have a church? And, and my wife told me later, you didn't see her going like this? I said, nope, I didn't. So I kept going. And then she said, yes, we do. I says, well, could I ask you what church? She said, we're pagan. And I said, well, here's a gospel track. It'll tell you how you can know for certain you're on your way to heaven. She actually took it, which I was thankful for. But, you know, when we were walking away, we are looking at all of the yard decoration. Like, I couldn't tell. How is it that that can be acceptable? That that can be accepted in our society today? It's because the devil has attacked what we're thinking, how we're feeling. And if he could do that, it'll get us participating in the wrong things. He may not be able to change your eternal destination as a believer because we believe the Bible teaches eternal security. That when you put your faith and trust in Christ as your personal Savior, you receive the gift of God was eternal life. And I praise the Lord for that. But he certainly can do all he can to wreck your effectiveness and your testimony for the Lord Jesus Christ. He can keep you from being a witness and a testimony to others. He wants believers to stop living holy, pure lives so he can hurt the testimony of Christ. He wants believers to be full of envy and jealousy and hatred and greed and immorality and every other form of wickedness. He wants us believers to think that sin is no big deal. It can be tolerated. It can be accepted. You know, I don't even have to deal with it the way that God wants me to deal with it. And how does Satan accomplish all this? He accomplishes it through the way that we think the way that we feel. And that's why we as believers must have the breastplate of righteousness. Put it on and keep it on. So what is this breastplate of righteousness? Well, first of all, let me share with you two things it's not. First of all, it's not self-righteousness. Look at me. Look at the way I dress. Look at the way that I've got it all together. Uh, there's some people that think, you know, if I can just make sure that I follow as many laws and as many commandments, if I make sure that I'm the best person, then God will accept me. And by the way, I'm a lot better than everyone else. Because look at my standards. Look at my convictions Never mind my legalistic mindset, thinking that I can merit favor with God, that I can earn my way of salvation. I'm better than others because of my standard of living than those around me. If I could just stop enough sin, if I can just avoid enough evil, if I can just do a good enough, that God will be pleased with me. But what they fail to realize is that their self-righteousness gives the devil an opening. And they begin to be attacked by the devil, thinking that their standard of righteousness is acceptable in God's eyes. But the problem is, is that we can't even live up to our own standard of righteousness. And none of us can live up to God's standard of righteousness. And what happens is the self-righteous individual becomes slave to their own thinking, and they know nothing of love, forgiveness, and grace. The Bible describes our righteousness, Isaiah 64, verse 4, are the filthy rags. You know, the, the animals that uh, Christ was wrapped in in that manger were the swaddling clothes. They were the rags that were used to wipe down the animals when they were sweaty, when they were dirty. Our righteousness is as filthy rags. So when we put on the breastplate of righteousness, well, I went to church today and I looked a certain way and I talked a certain way and I even smiled and I even said, bless God, and I even did this and I did that. 
I am fighting my enemy. I am standing. I've done all that I can to stand. You're a Pharisee. Many times what's inside is, just as Christ said, you look one way on the outside, but the inside you're full of dead rottenness. And so it's not self-righteousness. Secondly, it's not the imputed righteousness of Christ. Christian, come on up here. I want you to help me with something. It's just a visual illustration. I usually use Connor, but he's not here this morning. He's a little bigger than me, so this wouldn't work. Okay, so what happens when a person gets saved? When they realize the truth that God's word says, I'm a sinner, I cannot save myself. Uh, If I were to die of my sins, I'd go to hell, the lake of fire for all of eternity. But Jesus Christ died upon the cross for my sins. He was buried and rose again. And I believe what Christ has done for me, and I accept him as my Savior. I once was a sinner, but now I'm saved. And in God's eyes, the imputed righteousness is that I, who once was a sinner, so Christian, before you're saved, and Christian got saved, um, I think it was two summers ago, at one of our summer youth meetings. He put his faith and trust in Christ. So before that, Christian, you were a sinner. Just like, I mean, you, God looked at you, he said, man, Christian, you're a sinner. Just like each and every one of us before we were saved. But when Christian put his faith and trust in Christ to be a Savior, what happened was, and in this coat right here, my coat here, is going to represent the righteousness of Christ. Okay? So, and, and I, I, I fail in even using myself as a comparison, but let's just say that I represent Jesus Christ, and this is the righteousness of Christ. So what happened when Christ died upon the cross— 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21 says, Therefore he, that's God, hath made him, Jesus, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So Christian, who was a sinner, when he put his faith and trust in Christ, all his sins were transmitted to what Christ did upon the cross, which Christ forgave. He paid the penalty. But when Christian believed upon Christ... He got all of Christ's righteousness. It's going to be a little, a lot big for you, Christian. So this is what happens. Now that Christian is a saint, he's saved, he's put his faith and trust in Christ. When God looks at Christian, he no longer sees Christian in his sin. He sees the righteousness of Christ. And by the way, that's a blessed thought and truth for believers. To know that Therefore, Romans 8, 1, therefore there is now no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. I am no law, I no longer stand condemned for my sin because when God looks at me, he sees the righteousness of his son, Jesus Christ. He doesn't see my sin. That's a wonderful truth. Thank you, Christian. Go have a seat. I think I'm going to leave this off right now. So that's what happens at salvation. You receive the righteousness of Christ. That takes place immediately, and it's forever. Okay? But that's not the breastplate of righteousness, because it's something that I have to put on. So it's not self-righteousness. It's not the imputed righteousness of Christ. By the way, that's foundational in my life as a Christian. It gives me access to God. I can pray. I can talk to him. It opens the door of heaven to us for eternal life. It protects me against going to hell. But today, the imputed righteousness of Christ does not protect me against the attacks of the enemy, the fiery darts of the enemy. So what is the breastplate of righteousness? If it isn't the imputed righteousness of Christ, then it is the practical righteousness righteousness. What Paul speaks about here is the practical righteousness of a believer living his life out in the power of God, obeying the word of God. Simply put, it's obedience to the word of God every day. So positionally, I am righteous. That's how God sees me. But practically, I need to choose to obey God. That is what we call sanctification. Uh, 
sanctification is becoming more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Justification, I'm declared righteous. That happens at salvation. But sanctification is a daily process. The Apostle Paul in the book of the letters of the Corinthians, he said this, when we look daily into the, the mirror of God's word, the looking glass, we're changed by glory to glory. We're becoming more like the Lord Jesus Christ. So when I choose in the spiritual battle, if I, if I realize, okay, the strength, it's not from me, it's from the Lord, and it's his might, and I choose to take the, 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 the girdle of truth, and I choose to gird my mind about with the truth of God's word, when I am putting on the breastplate of righteousness, I'm taking the truth of God's word, I'm thinking about it. And, and by the way, I don't always feel like doing what the truth of God's word says, but the Bible has a wonderful promise. It says, commit thy works unto the Lord and thy thoughts shall be established. So I may not even want to do what God's word says for me to do, but if I keep doing it, then God will change my thinking about it. He'll change my thought process about it. So if I am putting on the breastplate of righteousness, that means that practically I'm choosing to think about and the emotions will follow, but I'm choosing with my will, I'm keeping my heart with all diligence. So that means that I'm going to ponder the path of my feet. I'm not going to look to the left hand or the right hand with the things of this world, the temptations of this world, the flesh and the devil, but I'm going to look forward. I'm going to set a guard about my mouth, about the things that come up out about of, of my mouth. I'm not going to have things that are untrue. I'm not going to have things that are, that are not edifying, that are tearing down others. That is the breastplate of righteousness. That is practical righteousness, knowing the truth and then obeying the truth. By the way, we can't do it in our own strength. It has to be in the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ. When we live in obedience to the Lord and his word, God is glorified and Satan has a difficult time getting an inroad in the believer's life who understands who they are in Christ. Positionally, I am righteous. I have Christ's righteousness. And practically, I am obeying the truth of God's word and I'm living the truths of God's word out. But what happens when I choose to play around with sin? I choose to think that, hey, it's no big deal. There are consequences. When the Christian fails to put on the breastplate of righteousness, what happens? They're robbed of their spiritual joy. You know, a lot of times in our life, we think that the problem is another person. But most of the time, the problem is right here. Because I have failed to obey the Lord. I have failed to follow what the Lord has said to do in his life. And because of that, there's guilt and there's consequences for those sins. Uh, did David lose any spiritual joy in his life when he committed adultery and had Uriah killed and covered it up? Listen to Psalm 51, which is his confession song. When he, confessions, when he confesses his sin, his prayer says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Hey, create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a right sphere within me and restore unto me the joy. You know, if I am not taking the truth of God's word and guarding my heart with all diligence, then what's going to happen is there's going to be no joy in my life. Oh, there may be temporal joy. And the things of this world, it gives temporal joy. But it's either going to rust out or a moth is going to land on it and eat a little hole in it and ruin it. Or maybe that'll be fashionable. I don't know. It seems like holes are fashionable now. Or someone's going to steal it. Right? That's why Christ says, Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through and steal. So we, when we choose to not put on the breastplate of righteousness, to not practically live out the truths of God's word in our lives, then what happens is we lose our joy. Secondly, we're robbed of spiritual fruit. 
John 15, 5, Christ says, I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. You know, we lack spiritual fruit in our lives when we're not guarding our heart with the breastplate of righteousness. When we're not obedient to what we know is truth and thinking about truth and allowing our emotions to be guided by the truth of God's word. When we fail to put on the breastplate of righteousness, we're also robbed of spiritual rewards. First uh, Corinthians chapter number 3 and verses 11 through 15, the Bible says this, For other foundation can no man lay than is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. If I'm choosing not to guard my heart, to not put on the breastplate of righteousness, to not be obedient to the word of God, even the, the good things that I do in my life, they will burn away. Maybe it's because I'm trying to get the approval of man, the recognition of man, but it will be burned away. If I fail to put on the breastplate of righteousness, it also dishonors God and it brings a reproach to his name. What do we need? We need to have our heart protected, our thinking, our emotions, our decisions. Can you look back and maybe see some times in your life where you didn't guard your heart? You thought about the wrong thing, you felt the wrong way, and you made the wrong decision? All of us have, right? And we could go back and we could think about those things and we could just stay in, you know, you know, pity, pity land and discouragement land. Or we could go forward. We could recognize this. Lord, you know, I sure made a mess of things when I didn't put on the breastplate of righteousness. I didn't guard what I was feeling. I didn't guard my thinking process. I didn't guard my decisions. And now I even see how it's not only affected me, but it's affected others. But God, today's a new day. And your mercies are still new. And you're ever faithful. So this I recall to mind, therefore have I hope. I'm going to start guarding my heart. I'm going to start, you know, I wish I would have started younger with my children, but I'm going to do all I can to help them see the importance of guarding their heart. That means I as a parent may say, no, you're not going to go spend the night at that person's house. No, you're not going to go hang out with those friends. No, I'm not going to give you that new device with access to the internet without any type of a, fil a filter. I've got to have a filter on my phone, on my computer. Are you wanting to guard their heart? Are you wanting to guard what they see with their eyes? What they think about in their minds? the decisions that they make. We can look back and we can see faulty thinking, faulty emotions, and faulty decision-making. And where does it all stem from? It comes because there is a failure to put on the breastplate of righteousness, to think the right thoughts, to feel, to, to take my emotions and bring them into captivity. Second Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5 says, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of Christ and bringing the captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Philippians chapter number four in verses six through nine, be careful for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God and the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Let me ask you, as we conclude this morning, are you wearing the breastplate of righteousness? Are you 
doing all you can to keep and to guard your heart. For out of it are the issues of life. Are you doing all you can for that child that's been placed underneath your care and your protection to help keep their heart, to guard their heart? Yes, there will be a time when they're on their own. Let's do all we can while we have them underneath. That's why the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he shall not depart from it. That's our responsibility as parents. Am I practically living who I am in Christ? I am righteous in Christ, but is there practical righteousness in my life? Do I have the breastplate of righteousness, a clean, holy life for the glory of God? That brings us to our third piece of armor that God uh, has provided for us to stand and the power of his might uh, to put on this whole armor of God. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 15. Here it says, And have your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. How important are shoes? Well, I dare say that the shoes you're wearing this morning are probably not the shoes that you wore on a hike this past week if you went hiking. Now, some of you, that may be the case. I know for me, it's not. I'm wearing, I, I brought several different shoes. I apologize. I don't think there's an odor up here. Uh, my nose is a little stuffy this morning, but I brought several of my pair of uh, shoes. So right now I'm wearing dress shoes. Uh, this would be an example of my, my church shoes, what I wear for church. Now these right here, I, I could wear hiking, I could wear weed eating. I could wear, I guess I could wear swimming too or canoeing, but that wouldn't be very practical, would it? I mean, these are dress shoes, okay? So I've got those shoes. Um, these are uh, some more casual shoes, and these would be ones that I would use, uh, you know, just throughout the week uh, here at church when I'm at work. Uh, when we go out on visitation, Tuesday at 10 o'clock, Thursday at 10 o'clock, Saturday at 10 o'clock. These are the type of, sh and sometimes I wear tennis shoes. If we're doing blitzing, then I kind of jog from house to house. So I wear tennis shoes because that's a little faster than these. Um, these are my, if I got to go outside real quick, my, oh, there's a thorn in the, I guess I stepped on a thorn. Uh, these are my, my sandals. Sometimes I wear them around the house wear them outside if I've got to go do something real quick outside. So I just slip on. Um, two Saturdays ago, Brother Roland and I, we went on a hike, uh, Pima Canyon, and uh, we hiked uh, about a mile back in, and then we hiked back. And on the way back, uh, there were people, hike, lots of hikers on that Saturday morning. It's just an absolutely beautiful, um, beautiful day to be out hiking. And there were people, they weren't like these Crocs right here, but they were like, you know, the sandals with the little thing for your, between your big toe and the next toe. Um, I guess those are thongs. There were people hiking in those. I mean, you could hike, but um, what I had for that hike was I had these boots right here. And uh, these are nice. They're comfortable. Um, I wore them when I attempted to hunt, but didn't see anything to shoot. I wore those. Um, this is a pair of boots that I'm still working on breaking in. I think I've worn them three times. I got them in a garage sale. It fit me perfectly. They're just a little, little hard. So I'm still working these in right here. As you can tell, I bought these for work boots. Not much work has been done in these at all. Uh, I'm like, these are so nice. I don't want to scuff them up, but these eventually will be work boots. And then this is another pair of boots right here. Cowboy boots. I don't wear these often. Uh, for a pair of cowboy boots, they're pretty comfortable. But you know, if if I were to if I were to be in the Olympics, okay, you don't have to laugh. It's not too far of a stretch of an imagination. If I were competing at a track and field event, I think uh, Adrian Manuel, your football season just ended on Thursday, right? And they got a win, so that was good to end on a win. Can you imagine what your coach would do if you came out to the game in these? 
he probably wouldn't be too happy, would he? No, now, I mean, these would be better than these playing football. I would imagine football players probably get their shoes or their feet stepped on. And the other guys, they've got cleats, but you need cleats for traction playing football, right? So whatever you're doing, there is kind of an appropriate piece of footwear. And I tell you what, ladies have a lot of a lot of different things they do because they have all different pieces of footwear um, in their closet, in in their their wardrobe assessment. Um, if, if you're a construction worker, uh, you're going to wear construction boots, right? And if you're dealing with heavy stuff, more than likely you're going to wear wear steel toed shoes because many things drop, and you don't want you know your toes to be broken. So just as important as footwear is to you and I, some of you or some of us um, have bad feet. I've got real flat feet. Uh, some of you have orthotics or you, you have inserts that you've got to put in. Some of you have special shoes that are designed just to help you to be able to walk without any pain. For the Roman soldier, his boots were very important in warfare. Um, you, you think about all the important ingredients of, of combat, of how important those boots would be. Uh, you think about the, the stability that they would need. Uh, they were mostly made out of leather. Uh, they came about halfway up the calf. Um, they also would have things embedded into the sole that would help them for traction, whether that was a piece of metal or even... Um, um, some rocks or things like that that would help them to have stability on loose ground or on uneven ground. Uh, can you imagine if, if their foot got injured, how that would disable them in the battle, how that would cause them to be ineffective? And so it is in your life and my life as we daily face spiritual warfare. As I tell you what, the enemy does not give up. He doesn't relent. I mean, we just had a great missions conference. I'm, I keep referring back to it, but it's real practical. We had a great missions conference. Many great decisions were made, but did the devil just say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop attacking so-and-so because they made that great decision? No, if anything, this past week, you saw some intensification of the attack some intensification of the temptations on your life. And so if we're going to stand, we need, just as a soldier, to have his feet shod with the proper boots, so you and I need to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. So these boots were desired. It would help protect their feet, but it would also help them to stand. And so it is, it will help you and I stand against our enemy. Um, I'd like to focus on two specific aspects. First of all, uh, what these boots depict. What these boots depict. Now, I'm going to give you an application of this verse before I give you the biblical interpretation of this verse. Okay, so this is what this verse could apply to. Now, I'll tell you from the beginning, I don't think it does. But there's still an application for us here, all right? So let's look into the verse, verse 15. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel. What does that word preparation mean? Well, it literally, it literally is translated being ready. Now I tell you what, I love these shoes right here. You know why? There's no shoelaces. There's no lack. There's nothing. I can slip on them. And so there's an appropriate thing for these. One of the challenges of these new boots that I have is how tall they are and how much you've got. It takes me a couple minutes to get each boot on because i got to unloose it quite a way. Um, but you know what? If I were to wear these, I'd be much more ready for maybe work or for something like that than wearing these. So when it comes to preparation of the gospel... Um, being ready. Colossians chapter, excuse me, Titus chapter 3 verse 1 says, 
put them in mind to be subject to principalities and powers, to obey magistrates, to be ready to every good work. Just as a soldier needed to be ready, whether it was to march, whether it was to engage in combat, whether it was to defend, he needed to always be ready. So you and I should be ready when it comes to the gospel. This is the application of it. Are you ready to share the gospel? I so appreciate as we were out um, on visitation yesterday, um, a- Asher and I, we, w- we were partners and, and we were handing out John and Romans. And uh, right at the beginning, he says, I'm going to keep one. I'm going to keep this one. I says, why are you going to keep that one? He says, I have a friend I want to give it to. And so at the end, I said, uh, we, were, we were having all sorts of great conversations. I asked, what are you studying on in school? And, and so he's talking about, you know, circles and shapes and all these things. I said, okay, so um, what's a right angle? He 90 degree angle, an acute angle, less than 90, an obtuse angle, greater than 90. Okay, so how many degrees are in a circle? Mm, mm, mm. It's four right angles, 360 degrees. So we're going through the math. And at the end, we have these bundles, 10 John and Romans in a bundle. I said, Asher, you started off with two bundles. I said, each bundle had 10. How many did you pass out? You have one left. Mm. 21? So let's do this again. And so we were going through it again. Finally, he got it right. 19. He passed out 19. He kept one. And he is telling me about his friend. About his friend who he believes in. And what Asher was telling me, the, the name of the belief system, I was like, I've never heard of that before. What is that? And so he starts to explain with this belief. And then he said this, but I know that's not true. You know, he... And I don't know if he'll do it tomorrow, but I pray sometime this week, Asher will give that John Romans to that classmate. He's ready. Am I ready to share the gospel? If someone were to ask me, how, do you, how did you get through COVID? Or how are you coping with COVID? How, how did you get through the loss of your family member? How did, you, how, how did you have such a good attitude when you went through cancer? Or when, when, when this terrible thing happened in your life, how was it possible? Are you able to give an answer for the hope that's within you? 1 Peter 3.15, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you the reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. And, and by the way, this application, it's a good application and there's great company. I think I read six or seven different commentators on, on commentaries on this passage. And all of them, that's, that's the interpretation they gave of this. And, and by the way, that's a true thought. And, and you can apply that to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We want to be ready to give an answer. We want to be ready to help that coworker and and the addiction that they're going through. And maybe you faced a very similar addiction in your life and you got victory through a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and you can help them through that. We want to be ready. Mark 16, 15, our theme for the missions conference. Go ye therefore into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Acts 1, 8, we have been enabled, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And then in Matthew 28, the Great Commission, we are told to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever command you. And lo, I'm with you all way, even unto the ends of the earth. So what do these boots depict? Well, it can depict us being ready to share the gospel. And by the way, those faith, promise, missions, commitments that were turned in last Sunday, that is a way that we can share the gospel by supporting these missionaries. And Lord willing, in 2022, we'll begin to support financially Jacob and Lydia Jones. We'll be able to financially support Nathan and Kristen Childs. And Lord willing, we'll be able to financially support Katie Dilfer. Three three new missionaries that we can support with the good news. That is part of taking the gospel, but it's just not 
Praying is, it, praying is important. It's just not giving. Every time you give that faith, promise, mission, commitment, you are helping send the gospel. But it's also when, when you're in and out of this community, sharing the gospel, giving gospel tracts to folks, inviting folks to church, sharing with them the hope that you have. What the boots depict is sharing the gospel. It advances the kingdom of God. But what do these boots deliver? What do these boots deliver? Really, this passage, if you look at the old context, it's not about necessarily about going while well, you can go to other passages like Mark 6, 6, 5, 16, 15. Go ye therefore. Okay, we're to go and share the gospel. But this passage is all about standing. It's all about putting on the whole armor of God. The context of this passage is talking about fighting Satan, not sharing the gospel. So what does the gospel of peace refer to here? Well, it refers to the wonderful relationship that you have based upon faith in Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Bible talks about having the peace of God and being at, um, being at peace with God, the peace of God. Uh, it, Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God. The peace, peace with God, and the peace of God. Theodore Epps said this, in spiritual warfare, Satan is out to destroy the peace in believers' hearts. He causes us to doubt and feel so that we are in turmoil of soul. Thus, the part of armor is to give us a settled walk that is peaceful. Um, I, I know that there have been times when I have been by a body of water where the water is real choppy and I'm watching something float in it. Um, it it's completely different if you're fishing and it's calm and you, I'm kind of more of a bobber sh fisher because uh, I know when the bobber goes down, I yank. You know, the expert fishermen, they can like, they can just feel the line and they know, oh, I'm thinking, I didn't feel anything. And, oh, yeah, you got one. Pull it, pull it. Set the hook. But you know what it's like to see something floating on choppy water and just being so unsettled, and all of a sudden you start to get a little dizzy as you're focusing on it. Uh, that is what happens in so many Christians' lives is they don't have the peace of God ruling in their hearts. And some of them are even struggling, do I have peace with God? Am I saved? Am I on my way to heaven? And so when it comes to being able to stand against the enemy, when it comes to being able to stand in for the truth, we need to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, the good news of peace. You know, to think about this, at one time, you and I, if you know Christ as your personal Savior, at one time, you were the enemy of God. Romans chapter 5 in verse number six, the Bible says, For when we were yet without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Verse 10, For if when we were enemies, that's before salvation, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we now have received the atonement. So before we were saved, we were actually the enemies of God. But now that we are saved, now that we put our faith and trust in Christ, if you put your faith and trust in Christ, you now have peace with God. You're no longer the enemy of God. You have been made right with God. Romans 5.1, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you at peace with God this morning? Is your soul settled? Your soul, my soul, the soul of my foot? No. Your emotions, your thinking, your decision making, who you are, are you at peace with God? Are you settled with that? Uh, Rob and I on Thursday, as we were going door to door, we were talking with an individual and, and asked him, uh, the leading question about a church, and uh, he, he, I believe he said, 
um, that he, uh, we talked to several different people. So it's either he said he already had one or he didn't have one. I, I think because of my next question, he said he had one. I said, well, that's great, but let me ask you, do you know for certain that you're going to heaven? And so he he started to go off talking about a kingdom and all these really strange things. And so I said, well, I've got this gospel track right here that will tell you from the Bible how you can know for certain. No, don't give it to me. I won't even read it. You know, that, that person, and, and to be honest, I think he was probably Jehovah's Witness, although he didn't come out and say that with just everything that he was talking about, the kingdom. And I told him, I said, well, I, I believe the Bible talks about a kingdom and that Christ is going to set up his kingdom in the future and then that we will reign with him. And, but you, gotta, you can't put the cart before the horse. You, you've got to you know, put your faith and trust Christ first to be a part of the kingdom. And so um, in, in this world, there are so many people that are trying to do things to get peace with God. But it's simply by putting our faith and trust in him. Colossians 1, 21 and 22, And you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreproachable in his sight. What is this having your feet shod, prepared with uh, the gospel of peace? It's the marvelous news of who you are, the good news of who you are in Christ. The peace that you have with God because of the Lord Jesus Christ. So the fact is, is that in your daily life, when the accuser of their brethren comes to you, when the adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, comes to you, when this world bombards you, when your wicked, sinful flesh presents thoughts that, you know, like, how did I ever even begin to think that? Well, it's, or why did that thought even come to my mind? It's because of our sinful flesh. But when all those things bombard us, we can stand because we know I am a child of God. I put my faith and trust in Christ, so I have peace no matter what, that, I can't believe that thought just came into my mind, but it was a sinful, wicked thought, and I cast it out. I cast it down. It's not true. It's not lovely. It's not virtuous. It's not of good report. So I'm not going to think upon it. And by the way, that's when sin happens. It's not having the thought. It's what you do with the thought. It's when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. So do you, this morning, <clears throat> do you have confidence in your salvation? Do you have the peace of God in your heart? Well, I'm a member here at Open Door Baptist Church. That's wonderful. That's great. I'm thankful for every member, but that doesn't mean that you have peace with God. Now, you have given a profession of faith, but if you're still struggling with it, you need to get it settled. I've attended church all my life. I've been baptized. I've done this. I've done, well, that's great. That's wonderful. But do you, are you at peace with God? Are you settled that if today were your last day, that you would go to heaven? By the way, having peace with God, it transforms and changes your life. You know, when a family member dies and you know that they were saved, yes, there is sorrow, but there's also hope because you know you'll see them again one day. There's peace. Yes, I know I've said goodbye or see you later, but it's not forever. I'll see them again. Uh, the peace, Having peace with God, knowing that I'm saved, helps me daily let the peace of God rule in my heart. So peace with God is salvation. The peace of God is the daily sanctification process for the believer. And so I don't have to have fear. I don't have to have worry. I can have the peace of God ruling in my hearts. In 2 Chronicles chapter 20, there's a story about the Ammonites and the Moabites, and they were two powerful armies, and they're preparing to invade the kingdom of Judah. At that time, it was King Jehoshaphat. And King Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah were very fearful. They thought there's no hope for us. 
We are going to die. We're going to be captured. We're going to be enslaved. And then the Lord spoke to King Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20, in the last part of verse 15, where he says, so this is the Lord speaking to Jehoshaphat. Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude. For the battle is not yours, but God's. That's kind of like God saying to you and I, cast all your care upon him, for he careth for you. John 14, 27, Jesus saith unto them, My peace I leave unto you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Come unto me, all ye that labor, heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly and heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. But what if, what if the septic system backs up again? We're getting ready for Christmas. We're going to have company. Talking about an embarrassing thing. Not be able to flush the toilet. That would be terrible. Well, what's going to happen if... The car breaks down. Or what's going to happen if, when I go to get my blood work, these bad markers come back? Or what's going to happen with this? And what's going to happen with that? Is that any way for a Christian to live? What happens if I, if I eat this? What happens if I don't eat this? <clears throat> God desires for the peace of God to be in our hearts. And so Jehoshaphat was told, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle's not yours, but the Lord's. So what happens? He believed what God said. And notice, um, follow along as I, or just listen as I read, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 18 through 23. So this is Jehoshaphat's response to the Lord saying, you know what? Yes, there's a great multitude, but don't be afraid, don't be dismayed, for the battle's not yours, it's mine. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. And the Levites and the children of the Kohathites and the children of the Korites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. And they rose early in the morning and went forth in the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Hear me, O Judah, and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God, so shall ye be established. Believe his prophets, so shall ye prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, he had appointed singers unto the Lord that should praise the beauty of holiness. And as they went out before the army and to say, praise the, so this is their battle plan. They're going out. The enemy has gathered a great multitude. And what are they doing? They're singing, saying, Praise the Lord, for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. What happened? King Jehoshaphat believed what God told him. Hey, don't be afraid. The battle's not yours. It's mine. So he told the people, the people gathered together, they went out to war, but their weapon was praise. They rejoiced in God. They rejoiced in his promise. And God did exactly what he said he would do. He fought for them. He took care of their enemy. Great peace for Jehoshaphat and Judah. And in the daily battles that you and I face in our spiritual warfare. God doesn't want us to approach the day in fear, fearing him, seeing God as some vindictive God that's just waiting for his children to z- to miss, mess up so he can zap them. That's not the loving heavenly father that we serve. He desires for us to walk in truth, to have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Uh, we don't have to live in fear, but we can live at, with perfect peace upon him. We can stand in full assurance, not in our own strength, but in the power 
of the Lord's salvation. We can be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. So what are some promises that God's given us as his children? Those who have put their faith and trust in him. Romans 8, 31 through 39. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh, maketh intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are accompanied as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of of, from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You know, yes, we need to be ready to share the gospel with others, but we need to be fully, that word prepared also means to firmly stand, to have firm footing. Hey, let's stop regressing. Let's stop slipping down all the time as believers because we're still doubting our salvation. We're still doubting if God loves us. Let's be fully convinced and fully persuaded. I have put my faith in Christ as my personal Savior. He saved me. I have peace with God. I'm allow the peace of God to rule in my heart. You know, to be assured of the love of God, the truth of the love of God, gives me confidence to stand. The truth that God saved me not by works, but by his grace, gives me confidence to stand. The truth that I am now his child. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Because I'm a child of God, I can stand. I am saved. I may not always feel like it, but I'm so glad I don't live my life based upon my emotions. How crazy would that be? Absolutely crazy. But I stand because I'm assured I have peace with God and I can have the peace of God ruling in my hearts. This morning, as we close this message on the spiritual armor about the, the boots of peace or having our feet shod with the gospel of peace, are you at peace with God? If you're not certain that you're saved, today's the day of salvation. Would you trust in him as your savior? Christian, are you allowing the peace of God to rule in your hearts? Are you fully persuaded like King Jehoshaphat? Okay, Lord, the battle's not mine, it's yours. So I'm going to praise you, trusting you, because you're going to fight the battle. You know, Lord, I've got all these burdens, I've got all these worries. I'm so concerned about this person in my family. I'm so concerned about this person at work. I'm so concerned about this health situation. But God, you've said to cast all my care upon you. Why? Because you care for me. I'm not to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let my requests be made known unto you. I can be confident that he which started the work in me will be faithful to complete it till the day of Jesus Christ. Are you standing with your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel? Are you fully assured that you're at peace with God? And are you walking in the peace of God daily. So that brings us to the fourth piece of armor in verse 16, where Paul says the believers in Ephesus, and above all, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. We've looked at the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the boots of peace, and now this morning, the buckler of faith. The buckler of faith. How were shields designed back in Bible days, specifically in the day that Paul was writing? 
Well, the Roman soldiers had two specific types of shields. They had one that they would use in hand-to-hand -hand combat. It was a shield that would basically just slide right over their forearm. And so as they were um, in hand-to-hand -hand combat, um, they could use that shield as a blow. Maybe they weren't able to, for, um, to block the, the, the blow or the, the thrust of the enemy with their, with their sword, but they could use the shield that was on their arm to protect themselves. That's not the shield that this verse is talking about. The other shield was a large shield. This word uh, used here is thuros, which comes from the word thura, which actually means a door. And so this shield would have been a much larger shaped shield. Most shields, thuras, at that, that time were about four and a half feet high by two and a half feet wide. So for them, unless your brother Ralph, that would only cover you know, his waist down, but for the average Roman soldier at that time, their height being much smaller, it would help cover their whole body. And so this shield, most of them were fashioned out of wood, and then it was overlaid with uh, strips of leather. And many times in a battle, and we'll talk about this a little bit more when we talk about the fiery darts, but they would wet their shields as well. Uh, a couple interesting things about these shields um, the Roman soldiers, as they would go into battle, uh, they would march side by side and they put kind of interlock their shields together and it would um, form what's called a phalanx. And it, it was almost just like a wall. Uh, history tells us that some of these walls of soldiers with their shields would be about a mile wide. And not only would they have shields that would be in front of them, but those coming up behind them, sometimes they'd actually, especially if the enemy had arrows, they would actually take their shields and link it up towards the top to provide uh, shelter or protection for above them as well. So in battle, in Bible days for the Roman soldiers, the shield was an important part of their armor. It protected them. So it is. The shield of faith is of absolute importance for you and I this morning. So what is this shield of faith? Is it the body of belief that we as Christians believe that we hold true? You know, as a, a Baptist church, there are some, some distinctives that we hold very dear, that we believe. We believe in biblical, the Bible is the authority for your life and my life. It's not, it's not any individual person. It's not a hierarchy. It's not a denomination. It's the word of God. And so the word of God has the truth for your life and my life. Is that what this shield of faith is? Just all the doctrines of what we believe? Or is it specifically faith, belief in God? Now, it's important to know all the doctrines of what you and I believe. We talked even some of those about the doctrine of salvation. It's through the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way to be saved. We've talked about the doctrine of eternal security. That once a person places their faith and trust in Christ as a personal Savior, they are saved eternally. There's nothing that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. He's given us to the gift of God, which is eternal life. Those are all wonderful and those are truth. But when it comes to the spiritual battle, when it comes to standing and not allowing the enemy to get inroads into our homes, inroads into our church, inroads into our thinking, we need to stand with the shield of faith. And that is simple faith in God. That's what's needed for salvation. Ephesians 2, 8, 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's how a person is saved, by faith in God. It's not faith in baptism. It's not faith in communion. It's not faith in works. It's not faith in Buddha or... Um, you know, any other belief system, it is faith in God. It's faith in him for salvation alone. In 1 John 
chapter number 5 and verses 4 and 5, the Bible says these words, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is a victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Faith for salvation, but also faith for our daily living. You know, it's faith in God that unlocks the blessings of God for your life and my life. Have you seen the blessing of God of answered prayer? I mean, where you prayed a very specific prayer and you saw God answering? That's a blessing that God has for those who have faith in him, believing, I will, as Jeremiah 33, 3 says, call unto me and I will answer thee and show thee great mighty things which thou knowest not. We cannot be saved apart from faith in God, but not only that, but our Christian life is all built upon, sustained by belief, by faith in God. Hebrews eleven six 6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Every day you and I exercise faith. We exercise faith that that car will start in the morning. We exercise faith that um, when we lay down in that bed, that the bed will hold up and support us. Um, I think everyone this morning, when you came in, you exercised faith that that chair would hold you up when you sat down in it. And, and we have faith in these different things, these different objects, as you go over a bridge. You know, I was, um, a couple months ago, I was um, going somewhere in Catalina, and uh, it, it was this old railroad bridge. And on the sign, it said something like, you know, cross at your own risk, and all these different things. So, you know what? I didn't drive my vehicle over it. I walked over it. And then, you know, when I met the person I was meeting, they said, oh, it's okay. You could drive over it. It'll hold you. It'll hold your vehicle. You know, we exercise faith on a daily basis, but you know what it's like when you've exercised faith and then the object of your faith lets you down? Um, when, when Katya was, uh, Katya now, um, for those of our, our guests, she's, she's uh, a young lady in our church. Uh, she was one of our first kids to ride our church van that picks up kids in the community. And she got saved, and um, she grew up in our church. She's now a, a junior at Pensacola Christian College, or excuse me, a senior, her senior year, nursing major, ready to graduate and get married. And uh, one of the, one of, Ka I think it was Katya's, um, seemed like they always had parties at Katya's house, um, you know, birthday parties and things. But I remember one time going over, and out on their carport, they had all these chairs and all these people and so here I am, my wife and I are coming, and I came over and I went to sit down in a chair. And you know what happens, especially here in Arizona with the sun, and if something is fabric, it may look like it'll hold you. Connor, you're shaking your head. Have you ever sat in a chair and it didn't hold you? Yeah, yeah, okay. But me too, kind of like, you know, Goldilocks and the Three Bears. I, I broke, I sat down, I just went right through the chair. Now, they were very gracious, and they got me another chair that, you know, could hold me. But we've all been the object of being let down. It's, it's sad, but we're all humans, and even we let others down. It's sad that today there are people who will not go back to church because a pastor, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, a church member let them down. They had faith, they had trust, and it was taken advantage of. I'm thankful this morning that there's a God in heaven who is worthy, who is trustworthy, and who is all-powerful to where we can put our faith in him and we can trust him. He has proven himself trustworthy. We need to make sure that as we're standing against the wiles of the de devil, that we take the shield of faith. 
a great example of this is back in Genesis chapter 15. In Genesis chapter 15, we have uh, the beginning of the life of Abram. Abram and Sarah, they left Ur of the Chaldees to go to a place where God had called them. And as they're going to this place, uh, Abram's nephew Lot joined him. And, and there was a disagreement between uh, Lot's herdsmen and Abram's, Abram's herdsmen, all their flocks. And so Abram said, you know, Lot, you choose what way you want to go and I'll go the other way. So the Bible tells us that Lot chose the well plain, well watered plains of Jordan. He pitched his tent towards Sodom, and eventually Lot becomes part of Sodom. Well, in chapter 14, Abram hears that there were four kings that came and they captured people from the city of Sodom, and Lot was one of them. So Abram takes his 300, and I think it was 18 armed servants, and they go and they have victory against these four kingdoms. And they rescue Lot and, and other people from Sodom, and they come back. And the king of Sodom is basically saying, hey, you know, you could take anything you want from the spoils that they took. We're just so thankful that you came and you rescued us. And this is paraphrased, but Abram says, I'm not going to take one thing from you because I don't want anyone to say that it was the king of Sodom that made Abram wealthy or that provided for Abram's needs. But can you imagine Abram? going and rescuing Lot, which was very commendable, but now he's got four kingdoms, four nations that are upset with him. Do you think there'd be a little reason to be fearful of revenge, of retribution? Certainly. I love what the Bible says in verse or chapter 15, verse 1 of Genesis. After these things, so after Abram has just rescued Lot, from these four kings, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. God didn't say to Abraham, Okay, Abraham, they're going to come and they're going to get you. So get your shields ready. Get your defense ready. Be alert. The enemy's coming. God said, I'm your shield. Now, you trusted in me, and you can continue to trust in me. As the Israelites left Egypt, the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night, that was to direct them, but when the Egyptians came and pursued after them, it became a shield. The shield of faith. How is your faith? in God this morning. He is all-powerful. And no matter what attack you may be experiencing right now, he is powerful enough to help you to stand and to quench those fiery darts of the devil, of the wicked one. Psalm chapter 33 and verse number 20. Our soul waiteth for the Lord, he is our help and our shield. Psalm 119 and verse 114. Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope or I trust or I have faith in thy word. No, we are bombarded from so many different areas and so many different avenues I think of our children, our teens, as, as they're learning the educational system, as they're interacting, as they're making relationships and friends, and they're living life, how much there's an attack upon them and how important it is for them to be able to have a faith and a belief in God that they can quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Well, we've seen the the design of the shield and the description of the shield. But how is this shield deployed? How is it that we could take the field, the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked? It's my understanding that in ancient times, the tips of arrows would be wrapped in small pieces of cloth, soaked in pitch, and then set on fire and launched at the enemy. If that, that arrow hit the target, uh, not only would it cause damage to the target, but when it hit, 
it would act it, it would be very similar to a grenade as far as there being shrapnel, as far as there being collateral damage, not as much as a grenade, but that was the intent of it. So you can imagine being in a battle and the enemy deploying these arrows, these flaming darts coming towards you and think now how much more would that shield, would that wall of shields be to help protect you, to dip it into water and and, and to make sure that when that flaming arrow came, that it would be extinguished. Uh, one commentator said this, it was not, uh, it was not uncommon in battles, uh, especially when the Roman soldiers deployed these walls of shields, for the wall of shield to look like a, a smoky porcupine because of all of the arrows that were shot at them daily. In your life and my life, we are assaulted by the fiery darts of the devil. Arrows of temptation. The arrow of pride. Satan loves to cast that fiery dart at believers. Now, it, it's okay. You don't need to admit you're wrong. <laughs> no one does anyways. Pride to believe that you're always right and never wrong. Pride to believe that no one else can do it better than you, so you have to do everything. Pride to believe that, you know what, I could be the exception to the rule. It won't affect me. How about the fiery dart of doubt? Oh, the devil loves to cast that dart. From back in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3. Yea, hath God said, oh, Eve, you surely won't die. But you'll be as God, knowing good and evil. The dart of sensuality, of impurity. The Bible uses the word fornication, which covers every form of, of immorality, of sexual sin. From an impure thought to an impure deed. And if you haven't noticed today in our culture, in our world, we are being assaulted in, in fiery darts of sensuality. You know, it's prideful for a person to say, you know what, I'm not doing anything. It's only a thought. I'm not touching anyone. I'm not hurting anyone. It's just an image. It's just something that I look at. You do studies on these people who are guilty of just amazing, wicked crimes. Many times it started with pornography. And that's a fiery dart of the devil, of the wicked one that he launches to us as believers. We're just getting ready for Christmas, right? Stores seem to hop over Thanksgiving, but the fiery darts of covetousness. Hey, you won't be happy if you have this. Hey, this is the latest, the newest, the greatest. You got to have this. Oh, my neighbor or my coworker or... The other person at the church, they just got this. I need this. I got to have that. The dart of co covetousness. The dart of fear. In case you haven't noticed, this world is, is preying on people's fears. The fear of, of all the what ifs and the, the, the if onlys. And we've seen that especially over the past few years and months. So the fact is, is that Satan is continuously coming after us. He's assaulting, he's letting these fiery darts of temptation and the potential of great conflict or the great damage that they can produce in our lives is great, but God has given us the shield of faith to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. I've told this story a couple of times uh, for different um, 
illustrations, but it it, it will illustrate how um, combustible or how how much damage will happen in the life of a believer if we don't hold up the shield of faith to quench the fiery darts of the devil. When uh, Rob and I were at Sun and Shield Baptist Church, we worked there for two years, and they helped us start Open Door back in 2010. Uh, one summer, we took a missions trip to um, Navajo, Mexico, to take one of the extra buses of Sun and Shield down to a missionary, Nelson Door. And uh, we, we met some obstacles crossing the border, but we got through that. And so uh, we spent the night at another missionary's home. And as we were leaving, we were on this two-lane road in Mexico, and the road was very elevated with steep banks on either side. And as we're dri- I was driving at that time, so I was driving along, and all of a sudden the engine's still running, but there's no power. And uh, so one of the guys, Chris, that was there, um, he was— he was a brain, still is a brain. He was an engineer. And I, I, here I am, you know, the church staff member, and I'm packed. What do I do? What do I do? You know, there's vehicles behind us. There's vehicles coming. There's really nowhere to go. And Chris just says, you got to go down there. I said, I don't want to go down there. He said, you got to go down there. And it's meaning go down the bank. And I said, okay. And he says, now kind of take it at an angle. So we take it at an angle. And uh, his wife, Renee was pregnant with twins at that time, and it was Robin and I and Chris and his wife and then Corey and his wife, and we're there on the bus, and here I'm thinking, okay, what are we going to do now, God? You know, we're taking this bus to give to a missionary and do some missions work. Now what are you going to do? And Chris gets out of the bus. He looks underneath it, and he looks up at me. He says, there's a fire under the bus. Just like that. No emotion, no fear, no, there's a fire under the bus. What had happened is because the bus, the metal under the bus, the engine was all hot and all the weeds were dry and they were tall and so it caught on fire. The, the vegetation that was dry was ripe to ignite. Now the rest of the story is we got the fire out, didn't use a fire extinguisher, that would have been you know, a smart thing to do, but we got the fire out. But that fire... Or that grass was ready to ignite. This past summer, we took uh, the the group of teens that came from Michigan, Fostoria. We took them up to Mount Lemon. Do you remember two summers ago when the mountain was on fire? Um, when we went to Mount Lemon, there was like two checkpoints, and they were making sure that we weren't going to, you know, um, have a charcoal fire. Um, that we weren't going to shoot firearms. Why? It's because still the land was ready to catch on fire, and if it caught on fire, it would just go. Okay, this is a reality for you and I as Christians. If we do not take the shield of faith daily and have a faith and belief in God that he knows what's best for my life, that his timing is always perfect, that God, no matter how I feel, no matter how the circumstances are, that God will always do what is best for me in my life, that God's not holding out on me. That's what the devil likes to say. Hey, God's holding out on you. But I need to daily hold the shield of faith. God, I believe in you. I believe your way is best. I believe your plan is best. And although I think you may be moving really, really slow, I'm going to wait. I'm going to trust you. And we have the shield of faith up because what happens is if we bring it down and all of a sudden we say, you know what? I believe I know what's best. That fiery dart is going to hit us. And when it hits us, our sinful flesh, our sinful passions are just waiting to explode. And with the fiery dart of the devil in our sinful flesh, it's a terrible combination. Joseph, Genesis, in Potiphar's house. Mrs. Potiphar continuously is casting herself at Joseph. Come lie with me. Come lie with me. And what did Joseph do? Those were fiery darts. Joseph said, You know what? Your husband, Mr. Potiphar, he's given me control over everything in the house but you. How can I sin and do this great wickedness against God? 
What was it that caused Joseph not to fall into sin? It was his faith in God. What will it that will keep your and my sinful flesh from being ignited and for there to be great destruction and damage in our life and the lives of others? It will be holding the shield of faith. But there are times when we start to rationalize. There are times when we start to justify. Well, you know what? It's not really gossiping. I'm just concerned about the other person. You know, it, it's it's not, and we start to rationalize. And as we start to rationalize, we open ourselves to the attack of the devil. We need to have faith in God, faith in his word, and keep up the shield of faith. So Satan, what's he trying to do? He's trying to get us to doubt the goodness of God. And if he can do that, we'll lower the shield of faith and we'll be open to the attacks of the the wicked one. Just as Eve was in the garden, she believed that God was not good. She doubted the goodness of God. But I'm so thankful that Matthew 4 gives us the illustration, the example of Jesus Christ. After he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, the devil came and tempted him. And he had faith in God. And he refuted the devil with the word of God. Proverbs 30, verses 5 through 6. Every word of God is pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Psalm 1830. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Again, Ephesians 6, 4, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. Parents, don't let the shield of faith doubt. There's so much that's at stake. There's so much ground that you have already fought for and won. Oh yeah, there's incessant pressure and your child, your teen will continue to come back and ask and ask and ask, but hold up the shield of faith. And you know in your heart that if you give in, if you allow that to happen, that something bad will happen, that they will be open to to the attacks of the enemy So you hold the shield of faith, and oh, what joy it is for us as parents when our children choose to hold the shield of faith for themselves. And they choose to believe in God, that his way is best, that his way is perfect. Abraham, you don't have to fear. Why? Because I am thy shield. We have a terrible enemy from without and from within. Let's make sure that we hold the shield of faith. That we may be able to quench all the fiery darts of the devil. For some this morning, it may be that you're like, Pastor, I'm really struggling with this whole doubt thing. I'm struggling and and it's, I've shared this in previous messages. It's at times discouraging to see Christians who once believed no longer believes. And I've got this fiery dart of unbelief in my heart, and it's still smoldering. Friend, you need to take up the shield of faith. You come back to the belief of God and in his word and simply trust him. It doesn't matter what so-and-so is doing. It doesn't matter that they seem to be dishonoring God with their life and they're successful. The word of God is sure. It is true. It is a buckler to them that put their faith and trust in him. But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, that he's a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Hey, Christian, let's stand. 
Let's do all we can to stand and let's pick up the shield of faith. Our faith in a good God and a great God. This morning we find ourselves in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 17 where it says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So we've looked at the belt of truth, the breastplate of righteousness, the boots of peace, the buckler of faith, and now keeping with an alliterated outline, I know it says the helmet of salvation, but helmets at that day were also called bonnets. Not, now it's not like Little House on the Prairie bonnet. Uh, that wouldn't do much in a battle, especially with uh, a two-edged sword, three to four feet wielding towards you, but a helmet or the bonnet of salvation. Uh, let's take a look at this helmet that was worn by the ancient soldier. It certainly would be very important to protect the head in battle. Uh, some helmets were made of leather, and then on that leather were, were attached pieces of metal. Um, others that may have been a little more fortunate would actually have a metal helmet that would protect the head. Now, as you were a foot soldier, and as you were engaged in hand-to-hand -hand combat, if the other uh, if the opponent or the enemy had horses and the modern, those uh, horses and chariots of Bible days would be equivalent to our modern day tanks. So really at a great advantage, um, the, the soldiers on horseback many times would wield these huge swords, three to four feet long, double edged. And you could imagine what that would do to your head. You imagine if you had a helmet the headache that you'd get, but certainly it would protect you from a fatal wound. So the design or the purpose of the helmet was very obvious. It was to protect the head. Uh, the, the sword that was used was a broad sword. It was a sword that would be held by two hands, and it also was a double-edged edged sword. And certainly the intent was to uh, hurt, to hinder, to decapitate the enemy. So, in the spiritual battle that we fight, we have a real enemy. We understand it's the world, the flesh, and the devil, but specifically here we've been speaking about the devil. How does the devil attack us when it comes to our minds? He loves to attack the things that we're thinking about. And so Satan, as he is in this battle, and as he's playing for keeps, and as he's trying to hinder what God's trying to do in our lives to help us on the road to victory, Satan's blows are aimed at our minds. What's he wanting to destroy? He's wanting to destroy that security that God intends for every believer to have. Isn't it wonderful to have peace in your heart knowing that you're safe? and secure. And there are a lot of unknown things in this world, even you know, to think that one week ago in Wisconsin, there was a Christmas parade and there was an individual who chose to use his vehicle as a weapon. And I don't know what the final count were, but too many people died. Too many people were injured. I mean, to think now, I'm sure that parades are taking a little more safety, security precautions. In a world of uncertainty and lack of security, the devil is trying to get believers to be insecure in who they are in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he wields his weapons a two-edged sword, and this morning we're going to take a look at the two edges of Satan's sword that he tries to wield against Christians to discourage them, to get them to have a false sense of, of insecurity in their lives, and that would be the blade of discouragement and the blade of doubt. How the devil loves to fill Christians' minds with discouragement and in doubt. But the helmet of salvation certainly can help you and I as we stand against our enemy. Let's take a look, first of all, at protection against discouragement. 
what is it? Just think, what is it that discourages your heart? Is it an unfulfilled expectation? Maybe a broken promise? Maybe a reminder of your past? And all of us have sinful pasts. And we're reminded of our past and maybe our failures. Maybe it's the problems with relationships in our lives. Maybe it's a health issue. But all of a sudden, we start focusing on these negative things. And what happens is our focus gets off the Lord. And we begin to doubt that we have a God in heaven who loves us, who cares for us. You know, people who have been in the spiritual battle a long time, and I praise the Lord for, uh, like we talked about in our adult Sunday school class, and the teens joined us this morning, the faithfulness of Daniel, and how even at the end of his life, he was faithful. But even as a person may have been in the spiritual battle for years upon years upon years, it does not mean that we're immune to being discouraged. In the Old Testament, I have some favorite characters. Um, I love Joshua. I love how he was uh, went from being a slave in Egypt to being the servant of Moses to then being the leader of the nation of Israel. I mean, Joshua, the book of Joshua, seeing all the battles that he led, uh, certainly a book uh, filled with all sorts of, of wonderful examples of faith in God. Um, I think of King David. Talk about a guy that you and I can relate to. Uh, Not a guy who was perfect, a guy who made some major mistakes in his life, but a guy who went back to the Lord and confessed and sought forgiveness and received forgiveness and cleansing for his sins. Of all the prophets, I love the prophet Elijah. In 1 Kings 17, he stands before wicked King Ahab, and he said, there will be no dew nor rain. And then he disappeared. And for three and a half years, there was no dew nor rain. He was miraculously sustained by God at the brook Cherith. Uh, Ravens brought him food. He then went to the widow Zarephath. And there the widow Zarephath sustained him. She just had enough food for one last meal. But as long as the prophet Elijah was there, there was enough food for them to eat. And then he stands at Mount Carmel before King Ahab and 450 prophets of Baal, and he issues this challenge before the nation of Israel. If Baal be God, serve Baal. But if Jehovah be God, then serve him. They had this contest, the prophets of Baal brought their sacrifice, put it upon the altar, and for hours upon hours, they called upon Baal to send down fire from heaven. And Baal would not. Elijah said, well, cry a little louder. Maybe he's taking a nap. You know, maybe he's talking to someone. Maybe he's asleep. Mocking them, they actually began to throw themselves upon the altar and cut themselves. But Baal, a false god, did not answer. Elijah calls for the altar to be repaired, brings the animal for the sacrifice, and then water as they had had a drought for three and a half years, was very scarce. He calls for barrels of water to come and to be poured over the sacrifice. And he prays, I think it's a 73-word prayer, and prays to God in heaven, and God sends down fire from heaven. And the whole sacrifice, the, the stones, everything is consumed. And of course, the fickle nation of Israel, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. And then Elijah slays the 450 prophets of Baal. And then he goes and takes his servant out and he looks out towards the sea and he begins to pray. He says, do you see anything? No. He prays again. I think it was the seventh time he prays. The servant says, yeah, there's a cloud coming. And so he said, Ahab, you better get back home. Because rain's coming. And so for three and a half years, there had been no rain. Fires called down from heaven. 450 prophets of Baal are slain. And now rain comes. And Elijah supernaturally, empowered by God, 
outruns the chariot all the way back to the palace. Talk about a mountaintop spiritually. Our church just a few weeks ago, we had a phenomenal missions conference. Our hearts were challenged by the truth of God's word. Our hearts were burdened for the missionaries that were with us and other missionaries that have been with us to take the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. And maybe your faith was stretched. Maybe you made some decisions in your life about serving the Lord. Maybe even giving towards missions. And you were on this mountaintop spiritually. Kylie just came home on Tuesday from Bible college, her first semester. And we so much enjoyed hearing what God has done in her heart and her life. And how God has worked and and she just loved talking about the Bible classes that she's had there. And all the things that she has learned. And you may be on a mountaintop spiritually like Elijah. Drought for three and a half years. I mean, you predicted it. God told you to and you did it. Fire coming down from heaven, calling for rain. Rain comes, outrunning Ahab. You'd think if anyone would be secure in his love for God and God's love for him would be the prophet Elijah. But discouragement came hard to him. In 1 Kings 19, 2, Ahab's nasty wife Jezebel said to Elijah, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow, about this time. An empty threat. The gods that she served, Baal and Ashtaroth, God had already proved them incapable at Mount Carmel. They didn't answer by fire. But yet, what does Elijah do after this amazing mountaintop experience? He runs into the desert. He basically says, God, end my life. He was racked with discouragement. And it may be that 2021 has been a year of a lot of victories for you, a lot of spiritual growth, a lot of advancement in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. And maybe you've been very consistent in your personal reading, in your worship and serving the Lord. But here lately, it's just like, it's dry. I'm not hearing anything, and I'm just discouraged. I, I'm starting to, you know, what? We're, we're having a, another another uh, variant of COVID out now? I, I, this this is going to become the new, new, new norm like flu. I mean, every year there's a new strain of flu. And it's going to be the new norm for COVID. But what happens is we get focused and we get discouraged, even though we see truths of God's word and and we've learned truths about who we are in Christ in the book of Ephesians, that we are redeemed. Just the fact that I don't have to go to hell, that I have a home in heaven should give me reason to be thankful, should be give reason to praise his holy name. But just like Elijah God, just let me die. We can face discouragement. And the devil loves to wield his fiery darts, loves to wield his double-edged sword of discouragement to discourage your heart and my heart even after great victories. Well, there Elijah is in the wilderness, and God asks him a question. I love how the fact that many times when we're not where we're supposed to, what does God do? He just asks us questions. 1 Kings 19.9, God asked him, Behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said unto him, What doest thou here, Elijah? Elijah, why are you here? 1 Kings 19.10, And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts, for the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with a sword, And I, even I, only am left, 
and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah, I got news for you. You're not the only one left. As a matter of fact, in the nation of Israel, there's 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to Baal. You can be encouraged. You don't have to be discouraged. But what does a devil like to do? He likes to isolate us from the truth of God's word and likes us to focus on our circumstances and get us discouraged. Someone has said Satan has many tools in his, and weapons in his arsenal, but discouragement is the handle that fits all of them. The twists and turns of life, and I know that we just celebrated Thanksgiving, but you may have come this morning to our church service discouraged. And you may be a new Christian, or you may be a Christian that has been in the faith for years. And you've seen the ups and downs, and you've seen God answer prayers, but this morning, you're just discouraged. You're discouraged about our country. You're discouraged about our nation. You're discouraged about our government. You're discouraged about the health care system. And if I keep going on, we may get even a little more discouraged. But I do want to tell you this. There is hope. There is encouragement because there's still God Almighty who's on the throne. He's still in charge and he still loves you. And although it may seem that he's not answered your prayer, it may seem that he does not know about your situation. There's not a sparrow that falls to the ground. There's not a hair that falls from your head. And if you've cleaned uh, the, the drain out of your shower recently, you understand that a couple of them collect unless you're completely clean of the hair, which some are. But there's not a hair that falls to the ground that God doesn't know about it. And so let's not allow the devil to use discouragement to root up in our hearts and cause us to lose our hope and our faith in God. Job, we read from Job at the beginning of the service. You know, Job kept his faith in God, even though all of the trials and tribulations that God allowed him to go through, God allowed Satan to afflict him. You can do anything but take his life. And Job said these words in Job 13, 5, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him, but I will maintain my own ways before the Lord. The prophet of Jeremiah, when he was called, God said, Jeremiah, you're going to be rejected. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to be attacked. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. No one's going to accept your message. But Jeremiah said this in Jeremiah 15, 16, Thy words were found, and I did eat them. And thy word was unto me the joy and rejoicing of mine heart, for I am, by, I am called by thy name, O Lord God of hosts. This morning you may have come discouraged, and Satan's wielding his tax against you in your mind and your thoughts, but you need to put again on the helmet of salvation and be encouraged that there is a God in heaven that loves you, and I don't have to focus just solely on the events of life, the actions of people, without filtering them through God's promises and through his word. When everything seems to be going against us in life, when nothing seems to be work, working, let's remember God's promises. Let's remember that he can take all things together and work them for good. Galatians 6, 9, And be not weary in well-doing, for in due season ye shall reap, if ye faint not. 1 Peter 5, 8, 9, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And you're going through that trial, and you're going through that difficulty, you're going through that challenge, but take comfort, you're not alone. God's with you. There's other believers that have gone through what you're going through. There's other believers that are, ha that are having more challenging, difficulty trials than you're going through, and yet God is faithful to them. His mercy is new. 
His grace is sufficient for their need. So when the devil tries to discourage you, remember all of God's promises. Have the helmet of salvation. Secondly, not only does the helmet of salvation protect us against discouragement, but also protects us against doubt. Doubting your salvation. Doubting the word of God. Doubting the love of God. That What happens when, when we're discouraged... It's interesting how these two things work to work so well together. When we're discouraged, we start to doubt God. When we doubt God, what do we do? We get discouraged, don't we? And so it doesn't matter which side of the sword Satan hurls that that he's hurling at us, whether it's discouraged and lead to doubt or doubt that'll lead lead to discouragement. But Satan wants us to get us to doubt. But remember Christ's promise, John 14, 27. He said to his disciples who still didn't get it, even though Christ was about ready to leave, he says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. What happens if we start to doubt the word of God? We start to doubt the promises of God. We start to doubt the love of God. We start to doubt the salvation that we have through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as we become easy prey for the devil. We do not need to doubt because in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are secure. John 6, verses 37 through 40, the Lord Jesus Christ says these words, All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will, which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one that seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up. In that day, John 10, 28 through 29, and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My father, which gave them me is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand. Romans 8, 38 and 39, for I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creatures shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5, Blessed be the God and Father of Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last day. You do not have to doubt God's love for you. You do not have to doubt the promise of God's word. Well, I'm really struggling with what I'm feeling right now. Well, bring your feelings back to the truth of what God's word says. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. To know that if I put my faith and trust in Christ, I have received eternal life that will never end. I do not need to doubt. I do not need to be discouraged. When Satan starts wielding those fiery darts, when he starts wielding that two-edged sword of doubt and discouragement, I can stand with the helmet of salvation, knowing God's promises, knowing that I am a child of God, knowing that I am eternally secure. It's not based upon me, but it's based upon him. He bought me with his precious blood. 1 Peter Chapter 1, verses 18 and 19. For as much as ye know that you are not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, 
but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. To know that I am his, that I belong to him. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, where it says, What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in of you, which ye are of God, and ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are his. Hebrews chapter 13 and verse number 5, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, this is God Almighty, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Isaiah 43, 2, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the water, walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. He will not abandon you. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, my grace is sufficient for thee. In your time of need, his grace is sufficient. As we face the battles, the struggles in life, we believe that one day he will safely deliver us to heaven where all those battles will be over. 2 Timothy 1.12, For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Friend, this morning, in the battle that you are facing against the world, the flesh, and the devil, as the devil is up to no good, and he's using the wiles, his tricks, his schemes, to try and get us discouraged, to try and get us to doubt the word of God. Let's be sure to arm ourselves to stand with the helmet of salvation. I am not perfect. I still struggle with sinful desires. I still struggle from temptations from without and the traps and, and the temptations of the wicked one. But I do know this, that I did put my faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he saved me from my past, my present, and my future sins. And I was born again into God's family. And I received the gift of God, which is eternal life. So I do not need to doubt whether or not I'm saved. I don't need to doubt whether or not God loves me. I don't need to doubt whether God's word is true. And when the difficulties and challenges of life happen, I don't need to get discouraged, which causes me to doubt. So Christian, this morning, I want to encourage you to arm yourself with the helmet of salvation, being confident of your salvation, knowing that he that hath the Son hath life. I have put my faith and trust in Christ as my Savior. And so I don't have to doubt. I don't have to be discouraged because God loves me. If he loves me enough to save me, he loves me enough to help me with the challenges and the troubles and the temptations that I face on a daily basis. If you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, I encourage your friend to call upon him. He loves you, and he will save you from your sin. Today, we're going to take a look at that last piece of armor, uh, the blade of the Spirit. Ephesians 6, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, or the blade of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know, God's given us so many wonderful things in our lives as believers. He's given us His truth that we can stand on, the truth of who He is, the truth of how He loves us, the truth of his church and his plan for his church in this day today, his spirit, his grace, his salvation. We have so many wonderful blessings to stand upon. Now we look at this last piece of spiritual armor that God's given us to stand for truth, to stand against the wiles of the devil, the blade of the spirit. First of all, we're going to see the identity of the blade, the identity of the blade. Uh, there were two specific words used in the New Testament for sword. The first one is ramaphaya, and this speaks of the long 
broad sword. And this is kind of one that we think of, especially in hand-to-hand combat. Uh, the big sword, double-edged. The second one is makaira, which refers to a smaller knife or a short sword. Uh, this sword would vary from 6 to 18 inches in length. And it was used in hand-to-hand combat, but basically it was used to stab the enemy, specifically in the abdomen area, which would have been a fatal blow. The word that Paul is using here in Ephesians 6:17, and the sword of the Spirit is that second word. The idea is of the short sword carried by the Roman soldier that was an important weapon in his hand-to-hand combat. It's the same sword that Peter used when he was trying to defend Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane when he cut off the servant of the high priest Malchus's ear. It's the same type of sword that was used in Acts 12 and verse 2 when Herod's executioners, they used this sword to martyr James. Uh, This sword was very important to the Roman soldier. It not only was a, a weapon, but it could also have been used as a tool as well. Now, when Paul is saying here and taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, he's not speaking of the physical sword. But it's that type of a sword, that small sword, is what he's talking about as an illustration when he says the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This is a spiritual weapon that you and I as believers have. Now, all the rest of the armor has been defensive. But now we have an offensive weapon. Sword of the Spirit, speaking of the origin. Aren't you thankful that the Bible, the origin of the Bible, God's Word, is from the Spirit of God? That the Spirit of God moved upon these different human penmen, 40 different. Uh, I think it was just over 2,000 years that these 40 different men lived, and he moved upon them, and they wrote the words of God. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. 2 Peter 1, 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You know, the Bible that we have today, that we read today, it's no ordinary book. It is the Word of God. It was inspired by God. In other words, God breathed it. God gave it. It is inerrant and infallible. Inerrant means without error. It is incapable of being wrong. Infallible, it cannot fall. This Bible, this sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God that God gave us, it's something that we can trust Not only can we trust, but we can obey it, as the very words are the very words of God. In the Bible, what do we find? We find the truth of who God is, the truth of who we are. We find the very mind of God, the identity of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We find the way to be saved. We find the source of all faith. We find help for the battles that we face We find direction for the path of life that we travel. We find peace for the times of storm. We we find joy to sustain us in times of sorrow. We find wisdom for the answers to the questions of life and guidance and direction for each and every path. John Wesley said this about the divine authorship of Scripture. The Bible must have been written by God, or good men, or bad men, or good angels, or bad angels. But bad men and bad angels would not write it because it condemns bad men and bad angels. And good men and good angels would not deceive by lying about its authority and claiming that God wrote it. So the Bible must have been written as it claims to have been written by God, who by his Holy Spirit inspired men to record his words using the human instrument to communicate his truth. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, it is to be read. It is to be believed. It is to be trusted. It is to be enjoyed. It is to be shared. 
It is what we must saturate our minds with its truths and soak in the glories that it contains. No other book in the world is like it. So when Paul speaks about the sword of the Spirit, he is referring to God's Word, the Bible. We've seen the identity of the blade, now the importance of the blade. Certainly there would be times in combat where the Roman soldier has used his shield. He's used his big sword, but perhaps he's dropped it. And so he would pull from his side his small sword to fight off the enemy. The the word here in the Greek where it says, and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of the God, it's the word of God. It's the Greek word rima, which literally means an utterance. So, This is the gem for you this morning, okay? Understanding the Greek word here. When it comes to our spiritual battle, our spiritual warfare, when it comes to the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, sometimes we think as Christians, okay, I'm fighting a temptation, so I'm just going to take my Bible. I'm going to take the whole Bible, and I'm going to go against the attacks of the devil. And, And we claim the Bible. We claim, you've heard, and by the way, I'm not, Please don't take this wrong. I am not minimizing the blood of Jesus. But there are people that in the spiritual tax and the spiritual warfare that they find themselves in, they will claim the Bible. They will claim the blood of Jesus. But that's not what God's given us in that type of an attack. He's given us the rima, the utterance. So there are two main Greek words that are used in the, the, the King James Bible when it comes to the translation of our English word, word. There are four main words used in the New Testament, but there are, two main, there are four different words, two main ones. Uh, the one that probably most everyone is familiar with is the word logos. In the beginning was John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word logos. And the word was with God, and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Um, That is a reference to the Lord Jesus Christ, the living word, who is the written word, okay? So Lagos would be the living word, Jesus Christ, the entirety of the Bible. What Paul is saying here is when it comes to taking the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, It's not the entirety of God's word that he's speaking of. Now, he's not minimizing the entirety of God's word, but what he's saying here is the utterances of God's word. So I have a problem with anger. Do I just blanketly claim the word of God and the blood of Jesus Christ to fight against that problem of anger? Or do I go to a specific utterance of the Bible? Ephesians chapter 4. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. You can look throughout the book of Proverbs and find many principles about anger. With an angry man, we're not to go. Um, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stir up anger. So when Paul is speaking here about taking this armor of God and taking this offensive weapon, what he's speaking is, is we're to take the specific utterances of the Bible. Specific passages when the devil comes against us and he attacks us. So an illustration of this, let's look now at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Here is a perfect, and it's perfect because it's the Lord Jesus Christ. Excuse me, Matthew chapter 4, we have the temptation of Jesus Christ. Uh, follow along as, as I read, beginning in verse 1. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit in the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, so here Christ is facing a temptation. If thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made bread. And he answered and said, it is written, 
Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If your Bible has a cross-reference, that's Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 3. So Christ, who is the Word, obviously he would know the Word, but he gives us the, the direction that we need when it comes to overcoming temptation. When it comes to overcoming the wiles of the devil, the sword of the spear, which is the word of God, that is the utterances of God's word. So Deuteronomy 8, 3, he used an utterance of God's word to fight the devil. Verse 5, Then the devil taketh him up unto the holy city and saith him on a pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, here the devil actually quotes from Psalm chapter 91, verse 11. So imagine that, the devil. He's a tricky one, isn't he? We already understand that he uses wiles, schemery, trickery. So he's taking scripture and he's twisting and perverting it. Does the devil ever try to do that in your life as a Christian? Do Christians ever try to justify sin in their life by taking twist, taking scripture and twisting it? Certainly we do. So he says, verse 6, And said unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge concerning thee. In their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. Verse 7, Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 16. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and showeth him all the kingdoms of the world, and glory of them, and saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan. For it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Deuteronomy 6.13 and 1 Samuel 7.3. So what did Christ do? He took the sword of the Spirit. He took the utterances of the Bible, and he used them against the wicked one. Someone said this, Think of the Bible as a vast armory. In that armory, there are weapons of every size and description designed for every specific type of battle. So there is a specific sword, utterance, as I already said, about anger. That if I have a problem with anger, I need to look at what the Bible says about anger, and I need to equip myself. I need to arm myself. If I have a, a problem with lust, with, with impure thoughts, that I need to arm myself with the, what the Bible says about impure thoughts. If I have a, a problem with greed, with gossip, with anxiety, with fear, whatever the problem may be, I look to what the scripture says about that specific area and then I arm myself with that. What happens when I arm myself with the word of God about that specific area? Did you notice that the devil didn't stop right away tempting Christ? He came back. He came from a different angle. He came with a different temptation. But Christ used the scriptures. But the wonderful, and this is, this is a blessing, okay? So it's okay to get a little excited about this. The blessing is this, is that when Christ used scripture, what did the devil eventually do? He left. He stopped. I think there's a verse that says something like that. James chapter 4, verse 7. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil. Is that in your own strength and ability? No, that's in the strength of the Lord. That is by using the utterances of the word of God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Now, he'll come back again. He'll come back later, but he will flee. Now, we'll still have this wicked world. We'll still have our sinful flesh. But friend, this morning, God has given you the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, to be an offensive weapon, to take it to the devil. The utterances, the truths, of God's word. So let me ask you some practical questions. Are you familiar with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God? 
you know, you can have an armory full of all sorts of weapons, but be unfamiliar with them. I mean, if you were to have several different uh, guns up here, there would be a few that I would probably know how to work, but never having fired them, there are some that I would, I would, I mean, I could tell what a trigger is, but to load the ammunition, to get the the safety off all this, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be familiar with it. Now, if I had a blade up here, I, I could use it limitedly, but there are some people who are masterful at using a blade, masterful at using a knife. Am I familiar with the Word of God? Am I spending time with the Word of God? Am I taking the Word of God? Am I learning the Word of God? What a wonderful promise we have that the devil will flee. Hebrews 4, 12 talks about the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the biting of sunder of soul and spirit, and the joints of morrow and is a cerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. The problem we have is that many of us, many people in churches today are unfamiliar with the Word of God. They don't know how to use it as they are daily attacked and assaulted by the attacks of our enemy. We must read it. We must meditate upon it. We must apply it in our lives. Thomas Guthrie said this, The Bible is an armory of heavenly weapons, a laboratory of infallible medicines, a mine of exhaustless wealth. It is a guidebook for every road, a chart for every sea, a medicine for every malady, and a balm for every wound. Rob us of our Bible, and our sky has lost its sun. Christian, we're in a spiritual battle, and if we're going to stand, we've got to take the Word of God. It's got to be more to us than just uh, a here and, here and now, once in a while thing. It needs to be a daily part of our lives. I, I, I love this, this illustration. H.P. Barber said this, As I looked out in the garden one day, I saw three things. First, I saw a butterfly. The butterfly was beautiful, and it would alight on a flower, then it would flutter to another flower, and then to another. Only for a second or two, it would sit and it would move on. It would touch as many lovely blossoms as it could, but derived absolutely no benefit from it. Then I watched a little longer out of my window, and there came a botanist. The botanist had a big notebook under his arm and great big magnifying glass. The botanist would lean over a certain flower, and he would look for a long time, and then he would write notes in his notebook. He was there for hours writing notes, closed them, stuck them under his arm, tucked them, his magnifying glass in his pocket, and walked away. The third thing I noticed was a bee, just a little bee. But the bee would light on a flower, and it would seek deep, deep down, down deep into the flower, and it would extract all the nectar and pollen that it could carry. It went in empty every time and come out full. Then he goes on to say this, some Christians are like that butterfly. They flip from Bible study to Bible study, from sermon to sermon, from commentary to commentary, while gaining little more than a nice feeling and some good ideas. Others are like the botanist. They study the scriptures carefully and take copious notes. They gain much information, but little truth. But others, like the bee, go to the Bible to be taught by God and to grow in knowledge of him. Also like the bee, they never go away empty. The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. How well do I know the Logos, the entire Bible? But how well do I know the Rima, the utterances, the very words of God? All of us here this morning, we're human. We struggle with our sinful flesh. 
We struggle with this wicked world. We struggle with our enemy, the devil. And the one offensive weapon that the Lord has given us is his very word. Do I know it? Am I skillfully handling the word of God? Or do I just, by the way, butterflies are beautiful. And there's, there's a lot of wonderful truths that you can learn even from the transformation of the caterpillar to the butterfly. There's so many spiritual truths that you can learn from that. When it comes to just fluttering around and landing, is that my acquaintance with the word of God? Just a here and there, just landing on every once in a while and not allowing it to change, not digging deep into it to allow it to change my heart and life? Am I like that botanist where I love to know facts, I love to know information, but I, I mean, it, am I inspired to change my life? I may be able to dot every I and cross every T. I may be able to expound the Greek and the Hebrew, but is it transforming? Is it changing my life? As 1 Corinthians 13 says, if I have all of this, but I have not charity, I am nothing. I'm nothing. I'm just tinkling brass and loud cymbal. Or am I like that bee? Where, and I realize there are some days where there's less time, but the time that I have, I, I look to God's word and I'm allowing God's word to change and transform my thoughts, my minds. I'm enabling him to help me. Oh God, I, I struggle with patience. I'm so impatient. And so God, I, I speak before I think. And that causes so many problems. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Be still and know that I am God. That I will be exalted amongst the heathen. Being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I just get so upset. I get so frustrated at myself and how I repeatedly fail. A just man falleth seven times, but getteth up again, but the wicked fall into mischief. God, you're not finished with me yet. God, you're still perfecting that work in me. And it's by the word of God and the spirit of God that you change me into the image of your son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I feel like there's no hope. This I recall to mind. Therefore have I hope. But it is the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. His mercies fell not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. It's the utterances of God's word that give us hope, that give us joy, that give us peace, that give us victory over the devil. As we close this morning, I came across these words uh, not attributed to any one particular speaking about the Bible. There are words written by kings, by emperors, by princes, by poets, by sages, by philosophers, by fishermen, by statesmen, by learned in the wisdom of Egypt, educated in the schools of Babylon, trained at the feet of rabbis in Jerusalem. The Bible was written by men in exile in the desert, in shepherds' tents, in green pastures beside still waters. Among its authors, we find a tax collector, a herdsman, a gatherer of sycamore fruit, we find poor men, rich men, statesmen, preachers, captains, legislators, judges, exiles. The Bible is a library full of history, genealogy, ethnology, law, ethics, prophecy, poetry, eloquence, medicine, sanitary, science, political economy, and the perfect rules for personal and social life. And behind every word is the divine author, God himself. We have been so blessed with the Bible. As the psalmist said in Psalm 119.11, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Is the Bible my daily bread? Am I using it in the spiritual battles that I face on a daily basis?